Welcome to Gary Clark Tech and the beginning of a new series in which we're going to use the Symfony framework in order to build a microservice. Now microservices are becoming more popular and they've been made more possible by advances in technology and the availability of tools such as Amazon Web Services, cloud computing tools which enable you to have a network of loosely coupled services which are able to communicate with each other. Choose high definition for the best viewing experience and if you'd like to join a growing group of software developers and take your skills to a new level all you need to do is subscribe, click the little notification icon and welcome. And so that's what we're going to build in this one. But first off, let's have a look at what microservices are and how they can benefit us. The application which you see on your screen is built using monolithic architecture, which means that it is a single tiered application where everything is contained in a single repo hosted on a single platform. The benefits of this approach are that it is a simple architecture, it's simple to develop, simple to deploy, and can easily scale horizontally by running multiple copies behind a load balancer. There are, however, several downsides to this approach, which are very real, and I've actually witnessed every single one of these downsides. Large monolithic code bases, they can be intimidating to developers, and the application can be difficult to understand and modify. And so the code ends up throwing up as many problems as it actually solves, and it becomes more difficult to change things. And as a result, the quality of the code declines over time. Continuous deployment is difficult because a large monolithic application is an obstacle to frequent deployments. Scaling can be difficult because you can't scale components independently so you have that interdependence which becomes a real problem in this respect and also that interdependence becomes a problem to development itself because it makes it more difficult to create teams which have focused responsibility for certain components and modules and work independently. You now have more inter-team dependencies which need to be coordinated. And probably the biggest problem I've encountered is that you can end up with a tech stack which you can't update. You might have an old version of PHP or an old version of a framework like Symfony which is no longer supported or maintained. And you could be faced with the prospect of having to rewrite the entire application in order to upgrade. So many companies fall into this trap. So let's have a look at the solution and that is microservices in which your application is composed of a set of loosely coupled collaborating services. In this type of architecture each service is easy to maintain and test, it is loosely coupled and it can be worked on and deployed independently. There are many benefits to this approach and some of these are maintainability because it's a more manageable size, it makes them easier to understand and to change. Services are smaller and easier to test. They can be deployed independently and you can organize development around multiple autonomous teams so your teams don't have to uh, rely on each other like they do with the big monolithic applications. You can choose your tech stack without being constrained by the rest of the application and you can also upgrade your technology a lot more easier or upgrade your tech stack a lot more easier than what you can do with the monolithic application and you can also isolate faults without them bringing down the entire application. The microservices approach does have its drawbacks. It's not the perfect solution for everything. Some of those drawbacks are you have to deal with additional complexity of a distributed system. Developers need to implement the inter-service communication and know how to deal with failures. So you'll find that devs tend to need to understand a lot more than they did previously when monolithic architecture was more the norm in PHP. Uh, testing interaction between services can be difficult and it, the increased deployment complexity can also pose problems. And so there you have the differences between the two systems and some of the benefits and drawbacks between using each. In this one, we're not going to be creating an entire uh, networked set of microservices. We're going to focus on one single microservice. We're going to be using the Symfony framework. And so we'll be considering some of the components we can use in Symfony, as well as thinking about our service and how it interacts with the outside world. If you've enjoyed this video and you'd like YouTube to show you more of my content, all you need to do is subscribe and click the notification icon. Each week I release a number of new recordings. If you'd like to be informed about my upcoming videos as well as receive exclusive content, discounts and early access to my new videos, you can join my mailing list by following the link underneath this video. Now that we've seen what microservices are and we've discussed how they might benefit us, let's talk about what we're going to build and then we'll finish off by installing the latest version of Symfony so that we're ready to start development. 
We're going to build a promotions engine, which is a form of affiliate marketing tool. If you look at the current PHP developer jobs market, you'll see that there are loads of companies which are building these types of things and they're building them as microservices. So I think it will be a good contemporary exercise for us. The way it works is that the promotions engine has a bunch of affiliate marketing partners who are able to provide discounts on certain products. And then the client application or the service can fire a request into the promotions engine with various pieces of data. And so the engine will then do its thing, go and find the best value offerings based on the data it receives. And some of the solutions you get today are really smart. They can use like literally thousands of pieces of data and artificial intelligence in order to tailor offers towards the inquirer. Ours isn't going to be quite that sophisticated, but we'll still get into some interesting programming. We'll post a few pieces of data as JSON, then internally we'll apply some modifying and filtering on the available offerings which we have in the database that we'll create in order to return the one with the best price for that particular inquiry. So if you look at the example we have here, we're just sending in a few handful pieces of data, product ID, location, voucher code, request date, quantity and so it could look at this and say okay the request is being made from a UK company or so in which case we can give 20% off or whatever uh, what's actually happening here if you look at the response is it's giving 50% off and it's saying the reason why or the promotion name is the Black Friday half price, price sale because if you look at the request date it is 25th of the 11th 2022 which just so happens to be Black Friday and so that will be the best offering it can find within the engine. Let's go ahead now and create a brand new Symfony project. I'm going to do this using the Symfony CLI. So if you don't already have that installed, it's very easy to do. You can download it from this uh, address here. And some of the benefits of these things here, you can create new Symfony applications, develop applications with a local web server, which I'll probably end up doing, uh, check for security vulnerabilities and get seamless integration with platform SH. So what I'll do is I'll go over to the terminal, I create a project using Symfony CLI, but I'll also show you the command if you want to do it using just plain old composer. So I say Symfony new and then the name of the project, so we'll call this Promotions Engine. And then I'll CD into there. And we'll just have a look at the files. Okay, so we've got all the files there for a Symfony Skeleton project. The other way is to go to packages.org and look for Symfony Skeleton. And so this is the one you want here. Click on that. And then you'll get this command here, Composer, Create Project, Symphony Skeleton. And so you paste that in your terminal and then whatever you wanted to call it, which in our case was Promotions Engine. But obviously I don't need to do that because I've already got it installed. So here I am inside my project inside of PHP Storm. And I'm actually going to go and pull in a couple of extra libraries before we make a start. So I'll say Composer, Require... Uh, dev because I just want these as dev dependencies and we'll go with PHP unit and also maker I don't think I need anything else off the top of my head at the moment But I know that I'm definitely going to need those two things. So we'll hit go Okay, and then we'll go and look at our composer JSON file and so when we said PHP unit what it did it actually got us PHP unit bridge these other parts here uh, Symfony Browser Kit and Symfony CSS Selector are dependencies of PHP Unit Bridge, as is PHP Unit, and the Maker Bundle just stands on its own, and we'll probably use that in order to make some entities. And another thing which you may have noticed is because we're using the Symfony binary, it actually already initializes a Git repository for us. So what I'm going to do is customize my Git ignore file for working with Symfony and with PHP Storm because. Sometimes it creates a lot of files which you don't actually want to have in your repository. So here's a useful tool which I use all the time. It's made by the uh, developers at TopTal. And if we type in PHP Storm, and we'll check that, and also Symfony, then cre click Create. What it will do is it will create us a Git ignore or some Git ignore entries. Uh, which are specific to the tools which we are using. So back over to our project and then in our git ignore file 
we'll go down to the bottom here and we'll just paste those in and then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to search for duplicates so I think that's a duplicate okay so that's all the duplicates taken care of let's go and have a look what's available to be committed so I'll add all of those with git add dot then I'll commit them with git commit hyphen m and we'll just say initial commit and so now we know what it is that we're going to build we have symphony installed and in the state that we want it in let's move on okay so we've now got our project set up we've installed some dependencies in this one we're going to create a controller create our first route and just have a little think about what order we're going to do things in and what would be the best way to do things in because we've got to consider the fact that although this is a microservice and this is what we're focused on there is still an outside world an outside application uh, in which we fit in so the order which we do things can be quite important but we'll talk more about that as we come on to it first off let's go and actually create our controller so down in source src you'll see you have a controller folder in there we're just going to create a new controller let's think about what we shall call this so even though we are dealing with promotions this is a promotions engine i've decided to go with the name products controller um, i had a little dry run with this and the name will probably make more sense or the decision will make more sense as we uh, work further into this so products controller And that is in source controller products controller and just before I go any further actually what I'm going to decide to do is actually keep each lesson on separate branches so I'm on the main branch here uh, I'm just going to commit this so git add dot which is git add all and then we'll just commit this Okay, and then I'm going to create a branch called the routes because in this one we're just going to set up our first endpoint. And so this is just a habit which I've tried to get into, which I don't always adhere to, but what I'll try and do is keep each uh, video recording will have an accompanying um, branch. So you can just go to GitHub and pull that branch if you want for that particular video. Okay, so routing. If we were creating, say, something quite RESTful, REST API, we'd probably do something like this. For example, if we wanted to get all of the promotions, uh, we weren't actually doing any kind of processing or anything. We were just hitting an endpoint and getting the data back. I might say something like this, promotions, and then using our attributes or annotations, we could create an endpoint like this. products and then uh, an ID so the ID of the product I'll show you how you can use that and then promotions so get me all of the promotions for a product with this ID and then you can give the route a name so we'll just call this promotions and then the methods which are permissible for this endpoint and so we'd probably just say okay only get requests are permissible and so yeah if we were taking that kind of restful um, approach where we were just looking to hit an endpoint and get some resources back this is the kind of thing that we would do however that's not the approach we're taking what we're going to do is we want to hit an endpoint uh, do some processing uh, we're actually going to do some filtering and modifying and there's going to be quite a lot of program involved in order to get the lowest price for a particular product so for that we'll do something a little bit different so public function and i'm just going to call this lowest price for lack of a better name really and then for our routing so again i'm going to go with products and then the id of the product and this time we're just going to say lowest hyphen price The name of the route will be lowest price and then methods we're actually going to post JSON in because even though we're only going to use a few inputs if you think about how these things can grow for example if we wanted to do a get request and we were using query parameters you might start out with like a small handful of query parameters but 
as your company grows, as you become partnered with more and more affiliates, there might be more and more filters and different kinds of promotions which you apply, which would mean you've got to apply more data to the decision making. And so you could end up with a massive um, query parameter list which stretches from here to the other side of the country. So what we'll do is we're going to say from the outset this, that this is going to be a post endpoint and that we're going to post uh, JSON into this. Okay, and what we'd like this to return would be a HTTP response. So what you're looking for is this Symphony Component HTTP Foundation response. And so before we go any further, and just in case you don't already know this, forgive me if you do, I'll show you how you can grab route parameters. So when we wrap these in parentheses here, this becomes a route parameter, which we can actually grab in our lowest price method here. So that's going to be an integer and we just use the same name as what we've used for the parameter and what we're going to do is we just dump this out so i can show you the next thing i'm going to do is start up a development server and i can do that using the symphony cli so symphony and then serve hyphen d means it'll give the terminal back to me and won't just leave it hanging okay great stuff so we now have a web server uh, which is listening at this address, so 127.0.001 colon 8000. So I'll keep a note of that address and then I'm going to go over and open Postman. So if you've not used Postman before, the address is at the top of the screen, very easy to install. Just going to start off with um, the basics, so don't be too intimidated by this if you've not used it before because it's such a simple tool to use. If we do get more into doing more complex stuff, then obviously I'll talk you through it in great detail. So here we are making a post request. Then what you do is you enter the URL. So let's just grab this and actually paste that in there. And this will go to products and then an ID and then lowest hyphen price. I'm going to set some headers, uh, which will be more about what kind of content our application can accept. So accept, and then application JSON, and then content type, again application JSON, and then you click on this tab here, body, and in there you need to pick raw and then from this drop down here just pick JSON so it's already set to JSON and then what I'll do is I'll drop in uh, some JSON which I've already written okay so we have a quantity of five request location UK voucher code is this request date is this and we've also sent a product ID and so the thing we're looking out for here is this because this is what we'll be dumping out we've said that the route parameter we've set it to a value of one so hit send, ignore the fact that we've got a 500 internal server error. Anytime you dump anything out inside your Symfony application, you'll see this. What you need to do is, uh, under this response panel here, click on preview, because that's where you'll be able to see things best. As you can see, we get the number one. If I was to change that to 22 and send it again, this time we get 22. And the reason for that is that we are dumping out our route parameter. So we've got our route setup that we want to use. Uh, we're using a route parameter in order to get a product ID, which will come in handy for when we go and query for that product in order to get the, the base price for it, etc. And we've said that we're going to use uh, only the post method because we're going to post JSON in because the list of um, field items which might be required in order to perform the filtering, to perform the modifying might grow quite large. Now let's think about what we talked about at the beginning, meaning the order that we're going to do things in. So you might have something like this and typically you might decide you're going to start with the domain. So you're going to start creating your uh, product entities or models or promotion entities and things like that and then working on the actual logic of how the lowest price could be arrived at. That is one approach that is probably the most common approach. However, we're building a microservice. So you need to keep in the back of your mind where you fit in in the outside world because 
There might be a wider application which is dependent on this service. There might be other parts of development of the application which might be dependent on this. And so I think it would be a good idea to give uh, those other parts of the application, those other services, something to play with, at least something which will return some data so that the other teams could actually continue doing their development. The DevOps engineers could actually start building out the network if they can actually hit the service and get some kind of response back. So we'll just put in a faked response. Well, it won't be a faked response. It'll be a real response with just some fake output fields. I've been in that position where I'm building something like this and I have actually started with the internals, with the uh, algorithm for sorting and filtering or doing whatever it needs to do. But you've had other teams um, like asking when will this be ready and there's nothing worse when you're trying to figure something out than being constantly um, badgered and asked when something's going to be ready when someone else can use something so a nice compromise is just to give the other team something to work with from the start so what we will do is we'll just return a json response so that is symphony component http foundation and this will work because it extends uh, response so return a new JSON response and then the thing that we need to return is the data and then a status code so the status code will just go with 200 the fields what I'm thinking will actually do is we'll return the fields which get posted in so if we go back to postman and we settled on these five fields here we this might change it might grow or uh, might get modified as we work through this but if we actually return the five fields the same data which gets posted in and all we're going to do is we're just going to add to this or modify it if we need to and so for that reason I think we could use a data transfer object where we get the fields posted in we can deserialize it into an object then do our filtering our modifying and then serialize it again with the new newly added fields or the modified fields and just send it back so i think that'll be a nice little strategy so quantity i don't think you need to see me type all of these out so i'll just speed forward a little bit so quantity request location voucher code request date and then product id and so i might as well make use of our route parameter there and we'll just say id so now let's go and uh, check this out in Postman. So this time, instead of getting this 500 response with the um, with the var dump, what we should see is those fields. So I'll we'll send this off. Okay, and so we get it in this format. If you wanted to see it in uh, like nicer format, you have these options at the bottom here. If you click pretty, then it'll just uh, display it like that, which is much easier to read. So this is quite good. Now we have a service which can be reached by other services. We're sending back a response in the format which is similar if not the same as what will actually uh, get sent back when we have a finished product. But it's all quite happy path. Uh, some things that you might want to consider is also giving the option of sending back um, an example error response so that the other teams working on their little parts can actually build in their own error handling as well. So let's have a go at doing something like that. One way that we can do this is to add a condition in here. So uh, anyone working on other services which are going to commun communicate with this can actually just send a header to our service like a force fail, just a particular key. And if that key is present, then instead of saying back this, sending back this 200 uh, happy path success response, we can actually send back a different response, an error response, and then they can build their error handling into their service also. So that's what we'll do. And we can grab headers like this. Uh, in fact, we'll need to get the request. So here where we're injecting the ID, we're also going to inject request, which will be Symphony Component HTTP Foundation. And then we're going to use this request to grab the header off that. So the order of these doesn't matter. These, this will still work just the same because uh, where we're saying ID here, it's just looking for the same word, ID. Okay, if request headers has so if this key is in the headers and like i say we'll just give it a name like force fail 
Then we're going to return a new JSON response and we'll just say error and then just a message like promotions engine uh, failure message. And then for the actual status code, what we can do is uh, we can set the force fail value to an actual status code. So if they want to test like a 400, which will be an application error, then they can build their handling of that. But they must, might also want to test things like um, server errors, so a 500 status code. And so that's what we'll do for this one. Request headers, and this time we're saying get force fail. And just to illustrate how this will actually work, in case none of that has been totally clear, we'll go back over to Postman and we're going to add an extra header here, which will be force fail. So we'll just make a little bit of space. So in these tabs here, this is where you add all your different bits. You can add query parameters, authorization stuff. It's where we did the body for the actual JSON. So on the headers tab, just going to add one called force fail and so like I say here is where we'll actually use a status code so first off we'll just go with a 400 and we'll send this off okay perfect so we get 400 which is uh, the status code which we wanted to send back and then we get promotions engine failure message so then if you want to like uh, build your service um, incorporate uh, server errors so then we can change this to 500 Okay, and then we get 500 internal server error. I'm just going to make a little tweak to this response here now because, like I say, we're going to be taking these initial values, but we're then going to actually add to them, maybe do some modifying. And so let's actually add on to these some of the fields which will get returned. So we'll say price 100. So that would be the original price of the product. Then discounted price. And so we'll say 50. Then we'll have a promotion ID. And then a promotion name. And so this is how we'll start. We'll start from the outside, from the response, and we'll work our way inwards, which is a bit different to probably the most typical way you'd work, where you start from the inside and work your way outwards with the most complex logic first, but at least by doing it this way, we will always have a service which is reachable, which other services can communicate with. And then as we do work our way inwards uh, to the logic handling stuff, we'll then start to replace some of these values with the actual real ones. We now have a controller and we have an endpoint and we're returning a uh, response in JSON format, but we've actually just hard coded in the values for now. So what I want to do now is just figure out what is going to be the flow. What will this controller do? Where will it send the traffic in order to get us to this point uh, where we can send back a successful response with the correct data? So let's think about the steps that we're going to use here. We've said what we'd like to do is take the data which is being posted into our service and deserialize it into a data transfer object. So that can be step number one, deserialize data into a data transfer object. So let's have a think about what that data transfer object is and what it represents. For lack of a better name, it's an inquiry. So we're sending an inquiry into the service to see what is the lowest price that we can get for this set of data. So for now, we'll just call it an inquiry DTO. So next, what we want to do is actually take that object and pass it into something. So it's going to be like a, a promotions filter in order to find the right promotions and to apply the correct uh, promotion to it. So pass the inquiry into a promotions filter and then the appropriate promotion will be applied. Step three, return the modified inquiry and then it'll get serialized again back into JSON and sent as the JSON response here. So I'm just gonna create a quick notes file just so that we can sort of visualize what it is that we're trying to do there. Okay, so we're going to pass our inquiry DTO into the promotions filter. And so that will find uh, the product to which it applies and then the promotions which are related to that product. 
And then we need to think about what we're going to do with each promotion. So the first thing that we're definitely going to need to do is uh, get it to ask the question, does this promotion apply? So for example, in the uh, the example that we looked at earlier on, we said if it's going to be like a Black Friday sale. So in order for that to apply, you'd be looking at the actual request date and seeing is that request does that request date match Black Friday or these Black Friday sales that sometimes last for a week, does it fall within a particular date range in which case then that promotion would be applicable and I suppose then the next step would be to either add um, the promotion to the inquiry uh, DTO to the data transfer object or do we want to just modify the data transfer object just modify uh, for example the price and the discounted price fields on the data transfer object I've not actually made my mind up of which of these two approaches I'm going to take yet one of the things which would drive this would be the business requirements. So you'd probably have clear business requirements which would say one or the other. Either, yes, uh, add all the promotions to the transfer object so that we have all the data to look at when it gets sent back. Or just go ahead and just modify the uh, inquiry to add the discounted price and the price or whatever fields are required. So like I say, I've not made my mind up on which approach I'm going to take yet, but I'll decide that as we move along. It's not that important right now. Our first task in order to make any of this happen will be to go ahead and create that data transfer object. So in promotions engine we're going to go into source and then I'm going to create a directory called DTO which can hold all the data transfer objects and interfaces which relate to them etc. And then we need to give this a name. So I'd like to go with something fairly explicit because there might be other data transfer objects for uh, other types of promotions or price inquiries. So let's go with a good descriptive name and I'll call this lower price inquiry or lowest price inquiry. Okay, so as you can see there, the namespace is app. DTO and the class is lowest price inquiry. Uh, I'd like this to implement an interface so a common interface for all inquiries. So we'll just go with promotion inquiry interface for the time being. Most of my code or a lot of my code, I, I never try and go with a permanent um, final product. It's just stuff that I work out while I'm figuring things out and then if I need to change things, it's not a big deal to me. By working that way, it gives you more flexibility. If you were just going for your final product, then you just aim straight for that target. Whereas if uh, I just have like a loose approach, then it just leaves the field open for all different kinds of or more options as we work through this. So I'm obviously going to need to go and create that interface. The next thing I'll need to do will be to add all of these properties. So one of the reasons why I've split down this uh, DTO and gone for something specific like lowest price interface is because you might have all different scenarios where you have different items of data and only some items of data will apply to certain scenarios. So you don't want to get in a situation where you're passing in like a hundred inputs in order to use only five of them. So that's why I like to break things down to that level of granularity. So we're only going to have a handful, a handful of fields on our lowest price inquiry. So private uh, int, and this will be the product ID. And so behind the scenes, I'm just going to do the rest of these because it'll probably take me a couple of minutes to do them all. That's all of those in place. And then for the getters and setters, I can get PHP Storm to do the hard work for me. So on Mac, I hit Control and Enter. This little generate menu pops up here. So I'm looking for getters and setters. And then I hold shift and just go down the whole list. And that will create me a getter and setter for all of those. And so the getters and setters will be used in uh, the serialization, which we'll come on to in a minute. Okay, great. So now we have all of our properties for our lowest price inquiry data transfer object. And now we just need to go and figure out how we're going to take the data which gets posted in to our service and serialize or deserialize that into this lowest priced inquiry uh, class object. We're going to need Symphony's serializer. This doesn't come with the um, skeleton 
install of Symphony, so it's something that we're going to have to go to Composer and require this. So, Composer, require Serializer. In order to be able to use the Serializer, we're going to take advantage of auto wiring. Uh, and we can do that using controller methods. But first, we need to take our product controller and we need to extend abstract controller. Okay, so now as the third argument to our lowest price route method here, we're going to say a serializer interface. And then just give that the variable a name of serializer. And then first off, what we'll do, because I'm going to explain auto wiring a little bit to you, is we'll just dump out serializer. Okay, then we'll go over to Postman. What we need to do in order for this to work is to uncheck the box where we're using the force file header. Should see a little tick to the side of that. Just uncheck that and it means that won't get used. And then just send the request. Okay, so if we preview this, you'll see that we are looking at an instance of Symphony Component Serializer Serializer. So what has happened there? Auto wiring enables you to use type hints in constructors and also in controller methods and automatically pass correct services to your classes and objects. So services, think of services as classes which do work. They perform functions uh, rather than the type of classes which are more associated with data. So why when I type hint serializer interface like this, do I get an object of type serializer? And the reason is, it's because a serializer interface is wired as an alias for the serializer. So when I ask for the container for a serializer interface, I get a serializer back. And so, like I say, out of the box, auto wiring works in constructors and in controller methods. Uh, only it won't automatically wire any class methods on classes which you create anyway Let's now take our serializer and do what we said we wanted to do with it. So the first uh, Task here or what we're going to finish on here is we're going to try and deserialize our JSON uh, data into our inquiry DTO so lowest price inquiry equals and you do it like this serializer we want to deserialize and so the first argument is the data. We can get that from the request get content. The second argument is the class which you want to deserialize into in order to create our lowest price inquiry object. So that will be our lowest price inquiry class. I'm just going to make my font a bit small so this fits on. And then the final argument is the format. So it's coming in JSON format. And so now all we need to do really is just dump this out to see if it's worked. Then back over to Postman, hit send. Okay, great stuff. So as you can see here, we have an app DTO lowest price inquiry and our fields have been filled. We have a product ID of one, quantity five, request location UK, voucher code is this, request date is this. So I've made some pretty good progress there in the next one. I want to continue working from the outside in. So I think that would mean that our next step will be to actually serialize back into JSON, but with the added fields, because we're taking some input fields there, but we want to actually modify our DTO by adding these new fields here, price, discounted price, promotion ID and, promote, and promotion name. So we'll set... Uh, those values on our lowest price inquiry and then we'll serialize back into JSON and then we should be able to send that back instead of these hard-coded values here. Where we're up to so far, we're now receiving data into our service and we're deserializing that into a lowest price inquiry object. So far, so good. So our next steps are to actually apply the promotions filtering in order to apply the, the best discounted rate and then to return 
the modified inquiry as JSON. So the way that we're going to work with this one is we're going to miss step two. We're just going to get some of this boilerplate stuff out of the way. So we want to return a modified inquiry. What does that look like? We need to add those extra fields, don't, don't we, which we are missing. And those are the promotion name, promotion ID, discounted price and price. And then once we've done that, we can replace all of this hard-coded uh, stuff here and just send back the correct uh, modified object in JSON format. So let's have a go at that. I'm going to continue to work all this out in the controller at the moment. So this is going to be a temporary measure which obviously will be changed and these values will be set inside of our promotions filter when we actually come to doing it correctly. But like I say, we just want to be returning um, modifying and returning the correct values on our lowest price inquiry object. In order to get a bit of auto completion, I'm just going to add a little uh, dot block here. Okay, and so that should make life easier for me. Then I can just say lowest price inquiry, and then I've got this auto completion, so I don't have to go uh, looking for this stuff or typing it out manually. So first we'll set the discounted price which was 50 and then we'll set the price which we said was 100 we'll set the promotion ID which we've said will be 3 and then we'll set the promotion name so I'll copy this Okay, good. So I'm just going to move this dump out of the way here. So I'll show you a couple of different ways in which we can serialize this. One way is to just uh, pass the object into the JSON response and uh, let it serialize it that way. So if I just comment this stuff out here, So again, I'm saying return new JSON response, and then I'll pass the lowest price inquiry, and then the code. I've still got my server running. If I go over to Postman and send this now, so we get an empty object. But we can fix that by implementing JSON serialize. So where we have our promotion inquiry interface, what we'll do is we'll just extend an interface called JSON serializable. This won't work yet, we need to actually go and tell our lowest price inquiry which fields to serialize. So as you can see we're getting a squiggly line here and what this is telling us is that uh, we're not implementing the method JSON serialize. So if I just hit Alt and enter on Mac then I can just choose add method stubs and then choose JSON serialize. If I go to the bottom here and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to tell it to serialize all the um, variables on this object. So return get object vars this. And so what that means is that when it comes to try and serialize this uh, lowest price inquiry object, it will just serialize, it will include every single uh, object variable, every single property on our lowest price inquiry. And so here, because we're using a JSON response class and not just the plain old response class, what it will do, it will serialize this as JSON. So hopefully we should get a different result now. Let's go and run it again. And so now, as you can see, we're getting our response back in JSON format and we have added those extra fields. However, you may have spotted an issue with this. And that is, it's not in the same format as what we sent it, because we sent it in snake case format. Let's have a look at the body. But it's coming back in the camel case. Ideally, we want to send it back in the same format as which it was received. So our solution that we've come up with so far isn't working, but I thought I'd show it you anyway. What we've used here is... Uh, the default settings for the um, Symphony serializer, which doesn't actually convert our fields to and from snake case and camel case, etc. That's not part of the default settings. So there's a couple of approaches we can take here. I could spend like 30 minutes Googling to see how I can um, change the default settings, or we can do something cooler and we can create our own custom serializer. So let's go ahead and do that. 
It'll give me a bit of an opportunity to explain to you how uh, the serializer works under the hood. So in source, we'll create a new folder there called service. And then inside of there, we'll create a folder called serializer. And we'll call our custom serializer DTO serializer. And this can be the standard serializer, uh, which is used for uh, any transfer objects which are used by our service. Okay, and this will implement uh, the serializer interface, which means that we need to implement two methods here, serialize and deserialize. I'll add a serializer property, which will be uh, an instance of serializer interface also. And then for serialize, we can say return this serializer serialize. And then the same arguments. This will all start to make a bit more sense in a minute. And then context, so data, format, and context, uh, exact same arguments as what you see here in the same order in the signature for serialize and then we're going to do the same thing here except it's going to be deserialize so return this serializer deserialize and then we'll add a constructor method where we'll actually go and build up this serializer that is going to be used by our DTO serializer. So this serializer equals new serializer. So that comes from Symfony Components Serializer Serializer. And for the serializer interface, that's Symfony Component Serializer Serializer Interface. Okay, and so the way that a serializer is built up is it has an array of normalizers and an array of encoders. Let me illustrate what that means. This is a Symfony documentation for the serializer. The way this works is, so uh, at first we're doing deserialization. So following this path here, it receives uh, the data in a particular format, can be uh, JSON, XML, or CSV. That gets decoded into an array. And so we will need a JSON encoder in order to do the decoding from JSON into an array and in order to go from array to JSON. And then we have uh, denormalizing and normalizing. And so for that, we will need an object normalizer because we want to go from an array, denormalize into an object. And then later on, in order to serialize this, we'll need to normalize back to an array and then encode back to JSON. So back in our DTO serializer here, we're going to say new object normalizer. And then for our encoders, we need a new JSON encoder. And so that comes from Symfony Component Serializer Encoder. Uh, for object normalizer, that comes from Symfony Component Serializer Normalizer Object Normalizer. And so we'll just tidy out these comments. Let's now go back over to con our controller. And what I'm going to do is just replace serializer interface here with DTO serializer. And then further down in our code, we need to physically perform the serialization now. So I'm going to comment out this and we shall say response content equals serializer serialize and that will be lowest price inquiry and then we need to specify the format which will be json and then because this should now already be in json format we don't return a new json response we just return a new response the first argument being the response content and the second argument again being the status code Okay, so if we go back to Postman and try this again now, you'll see that we still have camel case, and that's because we haven't actually told our custom serializer what to do with the properties. 
in our object normalizer, we need to do some configuration. Let's go and have a look at the constructor for this. As you can see, quite a few arguments. We don't need all of these, we just need one, and that is name converter. So we need some kind of instance of name converter, an appropriate one which will convert from camel case to snake case. Because I'm using PHP 8, I don't need to uh, specify this first argument. I can just use named arguments, which is uh, pretty cool. So name converter, and the converter I'm actually looking for is called camel case to snake case name converter. So nice descriptive name. You know pretty much exactly what this does. Let's go back to Postman and try this again. Okay, so this is looking good. Everything has now been converted back from camel case into snake case. It's in the same format which was received from the client. And so it will make sense to any client applications which are connecting to our service to receive back the data in the same format which they sent, which is good design. So let's finish off by just tidying up some of this mess that we've made in the course of that. All of this can now be deleted. Pretty good progress there. We're now able to serialize and deserialize our data so that we can modify it and then send it back in the same format which is re was received. So our next step is to actually start looking at this part here, and that is to pass the inquiry into promotions filter and apply the appropriate uh, promotion. And so this stuff which we've sort of done in the controller here, this will now uh, be done inside of the promotions filter when we get on to doing that. We're now at the stage where we want to set up our filter because uh, we've got our inquiry object. We want to be able to pass that into a promotions filter, do some modification, come up with the correct um, modifications, the correct discount price, price, etc., and then send the object back. So we're at this stage here, stage two. What would this look like? What would we like it to look like? So I'm thinking we can call it modified inquiry. And then how will we how will we obtain a modified inquiry? Thinking about this logically, what we want is a promotions filter with a simple method which just applies filtering. So how about promotions filter apply? And obviously that will need the data to work with, so we'll pass our inquiry in like so. And what will happen is that all of this logic here, all of the setting of these new values will actually happen inside of the promotions filter. And so what I'm going to do is create an interface because um, the filtering that we're applying here is to find the lowest price, but we might want to do other things. We might want to find the highest price or uh, do filtering for other criteria. So if they all have the same interface, the same one method, it makes it very easy for me to come up with something there. Inside of source, I'm going to create a directory called filter. And then in there, I'll create an interface called promotions filter interface. And this will just have the one method apply and it will take as its argument a promotion inquiry interface. And again, it will return a promotion inquiry interface. So it's going to take an inquiry, do some modification to it, and then send the same inquiry back. And so now we need our physical filter, which is going to apply uh, lowest price filtering. So again, inside of filter, I'm going to create a class, and we'll call this lowest price filter. which will implement our promotions filter interface. And so we get the squiggly red line. If I hit Alt and Enter, then it'll give me the option of adding the method stubs. And there's just one method, which is apply. Next, I'm gonna take these parts here because we didn't want this logic to be in our controller. We want this to be done as part of the filtering. So I'm gonna cut these four lines here, and then I'm gonna go over to the lowest price filter, and I'm gonna drop them in there. I'll need to change the name of this to inquiry to match the argument. These values are going to be set and then we're going to return that inquiry. 
This, by the way, is a temporary measure at the moment because we can't guarantee that these methods will be available on a promotion inquiry because if we go and look at the promotion inquiry interface, they don't actually exist on there. So, like I say, this is just temporary. Uh, our options are we could add these methods to the promotion inquiry interface, but let's think about this. Do we really want to do that? Are we going to need these methods for all of our uh, instances of promotion inquiry and there's a good chance that we might not and so if you think about your solid principles interface segregation you don't want to be adding uh, a load of methods to an interface and forcing uh, objects to implement certain methods which they're not going to use and have that redundancy so we're going to keep it where it is at the moment just to keep things moving and to keep the wheels rolling and so that up our service is reachable and that is giving back the data as we expect it but this is something that we're going to think about and we're going to come back and change it later for the time being we just want to make it work so let's go over to products controller and we're going to inject this into our lowest price uh, method here so let's start tidying this up so uh, it's a bit easier to read so I'm just dropping these onto their own lines and then the last one will be Promotions filter interface and we'll call this, I think we've called it promotions filter, yes we have. And now instead of returning a lowest price inquiry, we're going to return our modified inquiry which has come back from the filter. So at the moment you're probably thinking that this wouldn't actually work because we've injected an interface but we haven't created any aliasing or anything like that. So how does it know that we're going to want to use the lowest price filter? But well, if we actually go over to Postman and run this, as you can see, we're getting a successful result back. We've got 200 and we're getting our data. So how is this working? The reason that this works is some automatic auto wiring is going on under the hood. We only have one class which implements promotions filter interface and so symphony is smart enough to be able to just go and find the one and only class which is implementing this if we had two uh, classes which were implementing promotions filter interface then yes we'd have to go into the config and actually um, specify which one we want it to use in this instance but because we only have the one then it automatically auto wires it for us which is really quite smart and it saves us an extra step. Now what I'm going to do here is just move out some of these comments uh, because we don't need them. When you're using comments, the rule I tend to use is use them if you need to explain the why, why you're doing something, but you don't need to have them to explain what something is. We only put these in here to actually guide us from the beginning to lay out our roadmap. But when we know where we're going now, so we can remove those. And I'm also going to remove this. So our controller is a lot more slimmer now. Uh, we still have this bit in here, which I'm going to leave in for the time being until we add some more uh, our own custom error handling, which I'll probably leave towards the end of the course. What I'm going to do is go over to Postman and show you something. So here, where we've created our body and we've created a product ID of one, but actually in the URI we've used a product ID of 22 so I'm just going to do something which will make everything uh, use the same values on this tab here pre request script you can actually set variables environment variables so if I click here where it says set environment variable and here we'll create one called product ID I'll just keep life simple and set it to the number one. And then to use that in the URI, we just need two opening and closing curly braces. And as you can see, it's turned orange. And so here I'll say product ID. So now that should start using our product ID of one here. Let's go back to the body. I'll do the same thing here. Open and closing curly braces product ID so let's send another request okay and so that's working I'm just going to change this response format to JSON here okay so we're getting the values back as we would like we're now seeing product ID of one and that is the value that we are passing in if I go to a pre-request script and change this to a non 33 
as you can see we're now getting back a uh, product ID of 33. I'll change that back. Okay, so we need to finish off. What are our next steps? Well, we are passing in our inquiry here to the promotions filter, but it's going to need some more information. It's going to need the product, which will probably contain the price, and it's going to need the actual filters. What do the filters, what are the rules which are going to be applied in order to come back with the correct price? And so in the next one, what we'll do is we'll start thinking about our schema, and we'll start thinking about how we'd like to get uh, our data into the promotions filter. So far we've spoken about products and promotions, but we don't actually have anything physical which would help you visualize what I'm thinking. So I think in this one, what we'll do is we'll start to build our schema and then things should start to make uh, a bit of sense uh, when we're actually talking about these things. So the two main entities we're thinking about here are product and promotion. I've created some notes. Uh, we'll deal with product first. Very simple, it's just gonna have the identifier which we've spoke about so far and we've been using that in the URI. And then a price uh, which we'll keep in integers, we'll keep it very atomic. So if we were using euros, then the price would be in cents and then it's up to the client application how it actually deals with that. And then we have promotion. So I've, I've come up with five fields here. Um, ID. Uh, the name of the promotion, so for example, Black Friday half price sale. Type, we'll speak about that in a second. Adjustment, i.e. what are we going to do to the original price? Uh, what amount are we going to use to adjust it by? And then criteria, which will be a, like a rule of how to apply this adjustment. So I've got an example here which should help uh, you make sense of this. And so for this one, we have an ID of one and then the name of Black Friday half price price sale so the type this is going to be the important part because this is going to um, let our service know how it should manipulate this value so for this one it's going to be a date range multiplier and that will make more sense in a minute and the adjustment will be 0.5 so if it's a multiplier and the adjustment is 0.5 you're going to take the original price and multiply it by 0.5 and then the criteria, because we've decided to call this a date range multiplier, will be if uh, the date on which the request is being made is in between uh, the 11th, uh, 25th of the 11th, 2022, and 28th of the 11th, 2022. We'll have a look at one more just to help this sink in. So this one we've given an ID of two. Uh, the name is voucher OU812, so say you have a voucher code which is o, which has a value OU812. And then for this one, we're going to say it's going to be a fixed price voucher. So if you have this voucher code, you will get the product for a certain fixed price. And so there's no multiplying going on, it's just a fixed uh, price. So the adjustment in this case is going to be 100, so you'll get it for 100 cents. And then the criteria is that you have made a voucher code with a value OU812. So uh, thinking about this, what we'll need to do is so come up with some mechanism which is able to look at the type and then apply the correct uh, filtering or apply the correct adjustment to the original price based on that. So should be an interesting challenge. Now let's have a look at a diagram of the schema itself. Initially, you might think of something like this. So we have our product here and then we have our promotion. And so this is a many to one, many promotions to one product. But if you think about this design, it means that we'd have to have a product ID on our promotion. And what would that mean? It would mean that this promotion can only ever apply to a single product, but that's not what we want. We want to have promotions which can apply to different products. And so we're going to get rid of that one. And what I've come up with is this instead. So we could have a simple many to many where we just have a uh, intermediary table in the middle with a product ID and a promotion ID uh, between our product and promotion. But what I thought we'd do, uh, which might be a better design, is to actually model that relationship and have an actual entity which represents uh, the relationship between the two. And by doing that, it means we can add extra fields. So for example, we might want to have a valid two. In other words, how long uh, or until what date should this promotion be applicable to this product, which is a nice little design, I think. And then the relationship 
between these is a many to one. So many product promotions uh, can apply to a single product and many product promotions can apply to a single promotion. And so the other fields that we have in there are obviously the product ID, which refers to the product, and then the promotion ID, which will refer to the promotion. So this way we can have uh, many promotions which relate to many products. Hope that makes sense. Let's now go over and start creating our schema using entities. The first thing we're going to need to do is actually get Doctrine ORM. So we can do that with Composer require doctrine and so that will all install and then we have uh, an interesting question at the bottom here so it says the recipe for this package contains some docker information this may create or update a docker compose yaml or update docker file if it exists do you want to include docker configuration from recipes i'm actually going to say no here but i am toying with the idea of using docker uh, to create my database because I might want to use other services which ain't installed on my computer and so if I decide to go down that route then we might as well uh, add them all to Docker. If you don't have Docker installed or you don't want to use Docker for whatever reason then by all means use um, whichever database you have installed on your computer, Postgres, MySQL or whatever. For the time being I'm I am going to say no. Uh, I do have my SQL on my uh, machine. I also have Postgres on it, but like I say, I'm thinking of using Docker for that. But if I do, I'll show you how we can do that. We're not going to actually be creating databases in this recording anyway. For this one, we're just going to create our entities. So let's clear the terminal and then I'm going to say php bin console make entity. And first off, we'll make our product. So this one should be nice and simple. New property name. And so the first property, or the only property we're going to add to this, is going to be the price, which we said would be an integer. So it says field type, start typing integer, then I can hit tab because it gives me some auto-completion. Hit enter. Can this field be null in the database? Uh, no, we'll definitely need a price. Add another property. We don't need to add another property. Our product is complete. So now let's go and make our promotion. So php pin console make column entity promotion first off we'll have name and that will be a string field length 255 is fine can this field be null in the database no it can't add another property so this time it will be type again this will be string we'll stick with 255 and again this can't be null and then we're going to go with adjustment. And this will be a float. Can this field be null? We'll say no. Then add another property. So this is criteria. And we said this is going to be JSON. Can this field be null in the database? So again, we'll say no for that. And then that's all our properties for our promotion. And then we just need to add our product promotion entity, which is going to model the relationship between the two. And so for this, our main properties are going to be relations. So the first one, we shall call product. And for field type, use relation. And then it'll ask you which entity this should be related to. So that is going to be product. And then it will ask you the relation type. So we said that this is going to be a many to one because there will be. Let's go and have a look here. Each product promotion relates to one product. So that's the one that we want. Is the product promotion product property allowed to be null? We shall say no. Do you want to add a new property to product so that you can access or update product promotion objects from it? E.g. product get pro product promotions. I think that might be quite useful so I should say yes. New field name inside of product, product promotions, that sounds okay. Do you want to automatically delete orphaned product promotion objects? The default setting here is no, is no, but I probably mean yes, but I'm going to stick with the default. I'll just hit enter there add another property so this time we want promotion 
field type again will be a relation this will relate to a promotion again the relation type is many to one can the property be null we'll say no do you want to add a new property to promotion so that you can access update product promotion objects from it e.g. promotion get product promotions I don't think there's any point in having that I don't think it's anything that I would ever use so I'll say no do I want to add another property yes I do so I want to add a valid 2 which will be a date time can this field be null we'll say yes because by having a null valid two, it means that we haven't specified that it want with, that we want this promotion to end for this product at a certain time. So that'll be um, the best design for this, I think. Add another property. No, we're done with that so far. If we do want to add more properties to, to this later on, that's no problem. We can come back and do that. But let's stick to the design which we set out with from the beginning. And so now all we need to do is just actually go over and inspect our entities to make sure they're being created and they look the way that we expect them to. On our product we have an ID which is an integer, we have a price which, which is an integer and then we have a one to many relationship so this is the inverse of the, um, the one on the product promotion so one product to many product promotions so that is correct and then we have some getters and setters so this one's fairly simple let's go and have a look at our promotion and so we have an ID a name which is a string the type which is a string the adjustment which is a float and then the criteria which as you can see here it's saying that the column type in the database will be JSON but uh, in our entity it's actually defined as an array which is correct let's have a look at our product promotion and so here we have an ID and then we have a many to one relationship uh, so many product promotions to one product when we go to execute the command to create the SQL what it will do is it will create a column called or a field called product ID and the same will happen here so we have a many to one relationship with promotion so one or many product promotions to one promotion again this will be a join column and it will be given the name promotion ID and then this last one was just the date time which we added uh, we said it can be nullable and it is called valid two. so I know I've gone through that fairly quickly there but I've done a lot of stuff of on doctrine on my youtube channel um, just have a go through have a look through these in your own time you'll see that all the relationships etc make sense so these are just mapping or will map to tables in our database but we haven't actually um, executed the commands to create the sql yet so we haven't created any tables for our database yet or any X sql for those tables but that's what we'll do in the next one in this one we're going to go ahead and actually create our database so in the previous one we created our entities what we need to do now is run some commands which read the metadata on those entities i.e the annotations and converts that information to sql and then we'll run some more commands or another command which will take that sql and create the date the tables in our database so I decided that I was personally going to use Docker. Uh, like I said previously, if you want to use whatever database you've got installed on your machine, no problem, go ahead and do that. But at least by doing this way, I'm showing another way and then it will be useful to at least someone uh, to see how Docker integrates with Symfony. The first thing we're going to do is create a Docker compose file. So we can use this command here, which I've left in the notes.txt file. I've leave, I'll leave this file under version control so you can grab it from the uh, GitHub repo for this project. And then you can just uh, copy and paste these commands if you want. But this first one is php bin console make colon docker colon database. So let's go and actually paste that in the terminal. And so it will ask you a question. Uh, it'll say there's no Docker Compose file could be found, so a new one will be generated. And then it'll ask you which database service will you be using. So I'm going to choose MySQL. So I select zero. 
what version would you like to use? I'm going to use version 8.0. Okay, and so then you'll see these parts here. Uh, it'll tell you what your next steps are, which is to run Docker Compose up. But before we do that, I'm just going to go and have a look at the Docker Compose file, which has been generated there. So I'll hit enter. Before I spin this up, there's one more change I want to make, but I'll talk you through this anyway. So it's saying we're using uh, version 3.7 for Docker Compose. And then under that, we list our services. And so we have defined just one service, and that is database. The Docker image that we are using is MySQL version 8. And then it sets up some environment variables uh, for our database and they are a password, which we'll just leave uh, the default, which it just creates here, which is password, and the actual database name, which is main. And then it says which ports. So this is quite important. 3306 is the actual port on the container, not on the host machine. What it will do by leaving it like this is it will just uh, select ports sort of at semi-random uh, as and when we run uh, Docker Compose up. The one change I am going to make, or the one addition I am going to make, is going to add a volume mapping. And so this will map a folder on my host machine to one inside the container. So on my host machine, I'm going to call this MySQL, so that will uh, be found in the project root here, in the promotions engine project root. And then I say colon, and then var lib my SQL and the reason I've done this is just to preserve the data in between running Docker and Compose up and running it down. If I didn't do this then every time I um, shut Docker Compose down with Docker Compose down then what would happen is that all my data will be lost. So by doing this volume mapping here it means that my data will always be preserved. Okay so let's talk about Docker itself because in order for this to work you need to have Docker desktop installed on your machine. So if you go to uh, this address here, I'll leave it on the screen. This is the actual setup for Mac, but as you can see here, it says also available on Windows and Linux. Very simple to install, just follow those installation instructions and then you'll have Docker desktop on your machine and then you'll be able to copy all of the commands which I use from here on in. And so with Docker up and running, back to my notes file, I'll copy this next command, which is docker compose up hyphen d. So as you can see there, it's saying creating network promotions engine underscore default. And then it's saying it's creating promotions engine underscore database underscore one. So I'll show you a couple of things here first. Uh, the first thing you'll notice is that I now have a MySQL folder. So what I'm actually going to do is go to my git ignore file and add that on there because I don't want uh, my data that I create being held in version control. And then I'll go back and I'll just show you this other command here. So symphony var expert multiline. If I paste that in there and hit enter, so here you'll see some environment variables which have been created and some of these might look familiar. So we have a database, which is main, which is the same name as we gave our database in our Docker compose file. Uh, driver is MySQL, host is localhost, and then we'll see this database URL here. MySQL uh, is using root as the user and password as the password. And then we have the host and a port. So like I said before, a port is chosen sort of at semi-random. And so now this is our database URL. Uh, now typically, if you're using your local database, if you look at your .env file, you will be using whatever is uh, defined in there, which um, the default one is this Postgres one here. But because I'm using... Um, the Docker integration, that means that I'm actually using this one here. So this database URL environment variable is used in preference to this one. If we go and look at our configuration, so in packages, doctrine.yaml, and then you'll see doctrine dbal URL, and we have this environment variable here, database URL. So what happens with the Symfony Docker integration 
is that this bit refers to the service name. So this prefix is actually a naming convention. This is a Symfony Docker integration documentation and as you can see here, uh, some services have default Symfony prefixes, one of those being database. So as you can see here, database underscore. This database name here actually refers to what we defined in our Docker compose file. So that will match to that. And the same happens with other services which you can use. As you can see here, we've got Redis, Memcached, RabbitMQ, uh, Elasticsearch, Mailer. These all have default Symfony prefixes and you can define them in your Docker Compose file the same way as what we've defined our MySQL database. So just in case any of this looks like magic to you, there's a bit of an explanation. I'd highly recommend having a look at the uh, Docker integration documentation which you see here and that'll explain it much better than what I can and in much greater detail. But to get things working, all you need to do is follow the commands which I use here. So let's go back to notes. We've done Docker Compose up. What we need to do now is actually generate that SQL. So uh, like I said at the beginning, what's going to happen by running this command here, which is symphony console make colon migration. So very important that you use the symphony binary here, symphony console instead of PHP bin console, because we're actually using the Docker integration. So make sure that you prefix it with symphony and not PHP bin console like we've done up to now. And then what this will do is it will look at the database, look at our uh, entities, read the annotations on those entities, see what's different between the entities and the database and generate SQL to make those changes. So let's hit go. And so it says, uh, review the new migration. So a new migration file has been created for us and that can be found in migrations. And here it is. So what I'll do behind the scenes is I'll just tidy this up to make it a little easier to read. Let's have a quick whirl through this. So product, fairly straightforward. ID, int, auto increment, and then price is int, not null. Uh, then we have product promotion, which sits between our product and our promotion. So uh, ID, auto incrementing, product ID, promotion ID, and then we said valid two. And then you'll notice our two indexes here, uh, which refer to the product ID and the promotion ID. Then we have our promotion, so ID, name, type, adjustment, and criteria. And then you'll see that we have a couple of foreign keys. So product ID on the product promotions table points to ID on the product table. And then we have the promotion ID on the product promotion table points to the ID um, field on the promotion table. So far so good, but this hasn't been created in our database yet. What we need to do is actually go and run a final command in order to generate those tables. So I'll copy this and then we'll paste that in there. So again, we need to make sure that we're prefixing this with Symfony console and it is doctrine migrations migrate. And so I'll ask you if you're sure that you want to actually run this command, just say yes. Okay, and so now it's telling us that the migrations have been executed. We should be able to go and look at our tables. Before I go and look at those, I need to just get the port. So when I did the Symfony file export, if I run that command again, and then I can see that the port I'm using is 50948. So I'll copy that, and then I go over to table plus, and here I'm just going to edit my MySQL connection. So I could call this connection anything, that doesn't matter. As you can see, the host is localhost, uh, the user is root, password is password, so we got that from our Docker compose file. Let's go back and have a quick look at that just to remind ourselves. So as you can see here, MySQL root password is what that is referring to, and the database name was main. And then we had a port number, which was 50948. So we paste that in there. Then I'll just test this connection. All green, which tells me that it's working. So let's connect. Okay, so here you can see that my tables have been created, as well as one other table, which holds the uh, doctrine migrations. So that will have one record in, and that is uh, to refer to our doctrine 
uh, version file where our SQL is defined and then here we should have empty table. So product which just has ID and price, product promotion which has, which has the four fields there, product ID, promotion ID and valid two and then we have promotion. And if we look at the structure, uh, it'll tell you what the data types are. And because we're using MySQLite, uh, then we don't need a workaround to use JSON. We can actually use JSON in there. And so that completes our database setup. It might look like a lot of information, but in reality, we only really ran four commands. If we go and look at our notes file, uh, we just wrote, uh, wrote four commands. One to create a, a Docker Compose file. And then we went and made edits or quick edit to that Docker Compose file. And then we ran Docker Compose up, which ran up all our services in the Docker Compose file, created our migration, so our version file. And then we just executed that SQL in the version file to create our database, which is what you see here. In this one, we're going to query for the actual data which we will use and which will get passed into our promotions filter. So behind the scenes, what I've done is I've just created some SQL just to um, populate the database with some starter data. So I've got some SQL files here, which you can just copy. So I've got one for the products table, very simple, just uh, creates two product records. And then we have one for promotions. And so there are a couple of promotions to go into the promotions table. And then of course we have our join table, which is the product promotion. And so just a couple of simple records there, uh, which will create those joins for us. We have a look at the database. Uh, if we have more of a visual look using table plus. So there you'll see our two products. Here you can see our two promotions. So if you recall how we said we were going to do this, uh, it's got an ID, a name, a type. So what type of promotion and that will help us to apply the correct filtering and then an adjustment and then the criteria, the actual rules on how to apply this filter and how to see if it's actual, uh, actually valid. And so there we just have a couple of dates to and from. And then this next one is going to be a fixed price. So it's setting a product to a fixed price if it has a voucher code of this. Hopefully that's straightforward. We've already uh, been through that once, so we don't need to go through that much in great detail. And then we have the product promotion table, which is um, the join table. So this will be interesting. This will come into play when we go to do the query. And so... Uh, in order for it, uh, in order for the promotion to be valid for the product, we'll have a valid to field, uh, which will be a date at which point it then expires. So if the request date falls after the valid to date, then it will have expired. But if the request date is before valid to, then that'll be, uh, that promotion will still be valid. And also if the valid to value is null, then that promotion will still be valid also. So let's make a start on this and we'll think about how we'd like to pass the data once we've queried it into our promotions filter. The way I thought this might be logical would be to have the data, the already existing uh, data which gets passed in, and then as a separate argument, we can have the promotions. That just seems logical to me. And what I'd like to do is sort of keep the promotion separate from the product. So I could query for the product and get the promotions for that product all in one go. But I'm thinking what I'm going to do is do a single query for the product. If the product isn't found, then we'll just send back an error. Otherwise, we'll then use that product to query for the promotions which apply to it. And what I'm also thinking of doing is I will then add the product as data to lowest price inquiry. So here, at the moment, we have a property for the product ID here. But what I'm thinking of doing is actually replacing that with a product object, and that will make more sense. And then we'll be able to get the price off of that product. So let's start querying for this. This is the product's controller, and so I think it will make sense. We want to get hold of the product. So I think what I'm going to do is actually create a constructor and then in there, we will actually get the product repository because uh, when we created our product entity and our promotion entity, we actually created 
uh, repositories for those as well. So in the repository folder here, you'll see we have the product repository, promotion repository, repository, and the product promotion repository. So we have access to those things. So here we'll say product repository. And because it's product controller, instead of naming it product uh, repository, we'll just call it repository. I'm using PHP 8, which means I can use promoted properties like this. And so down here, what we'll do after our lowest price inquiry, we'll say product equals this repository find. And then we just need the ID, which as you recall, is being passed in as a route parameter. So then we'll say ID. And we'll go and dump that product out in a second just to have a look at it. But what I'm going to do here is just leave a comment to say add error handling. I'm not going to put the error handling in just yet because I want to have something which is uniform throughout the entire service for that. So I'm going to have a think about error handling at the end. And at the moment, we're just going to stay fairly happy path. So there I've just said add error handling for not found product. And then here we'll go and dump out the product just to check that our query is actually working. So in Postman, let's send this off. And then here we have app entity product. Perfect. Then like I say, what I'd like to do is actually add a product property to the lowest price inquiry rather than a product ID. So let's go and change that now. So this will be a product and then we'll change the name. And then we need to look for references to product ID. So I'm going to remove the getter and the setter for the product ID, which is my first two getters and setters there. Delete those. Then underneath in PHP Storm on a Mac, I can hit Control and Enter. And this will give me the option to add getters and setters. So I'm just going to add uh, them for product. So if you don't have that option, if you're using a different editor, just add these this getter and setter here. Get product and set product and then I'm going to go back to the products controller and I'm just going to say lowest price inquiry set product product next what I want to do is get all of the promotions which are valid for the product so for this what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a custom query and I'll put that inside the promotions repository. So first off, we need to get the promotions repository. I don't really want to add it to the constructor. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to get it off of an entity manager. And so what I'll do is I'll drop this onto another line. And so there we have an entity manager. And then what I'll do is I'll say promotions equals this entity manager get repository promotion class and then we need a descriptive name um, a descriptive method name for getting all of the valid promotions for the product i shall call this find valid for product And so obviously we're going to need a product for this. And then if you recall how we said that it would be valid, it would be valid if the request date was made before the valid to date or if the valid to date was null. So we're going to need to get the request date. And if you recall, we can get that off of our lowest price inquiry. We'll just go and have a quick look at that. So here we go. We're passing a request date to that. So back in our controller. We'll say date create immutable and then lowest price inquiry get request date. Let's go over to promotion repository. So promotion repository and then here underneath the constructor, this is where we'll create our method. Find valid for product. So the first argument is going to be a product and then the second one will be a date time so we'll say date time interface and this will be the request date and so the way I'm going to do this is going to be with the query builder and some doctrine doctrine query language so we'll say return and then this create query builder 
Here we just need to pass an alias, so we'll say P for promotions. And then what I'm gonna need to do is actually do an inner join on the product promotion in order to get all promotions for a particular product. Thinking about that, what I did was I didn't include something which I included in the product entity. If we go and look at the product entity, we created this property here, product promotions, but I didn't think it was something which I was gonna need on my promotion, but I actually think that now I am going to need it. So what I'm gonna do, forgive me because I'm jumping around a little bit here. I'm gonna copy that from the product. We will go to the promotion. And then as the final property here, we'll paste that in there. And then we just need to make a change where it says mapped by, instead of saying product, this will be promotion. And then if we go and look at the product promotion, you'll see what I mean by that. And we're looking at this property here, the promotion property. So that is referring to this. And likewise, I did in the product class where we created, uh, where we set this to an array collection in the constructor. We'll just copy the constructor from there and then we shall drop that as the first method in there. And then down at the bottom, I just want to add a getter for the product promotions. So uh, here where it says getters, product promotions. So again, if you're not using PHP Storm, just copy this getter here. Now back in promotion repository, we can say inner join, product promotions, We'll give that an alias of PP and then we'll say and where PP product equals and we're going to use parameter binding here so we'll say product and then we'll use another and where. So there is a where clause, uh, but I advise against using it because when you use another where after that, then it means that that one gets overwritten. So always use and where, or in most cases use and where. So then we're gonna say and where, and this one's a little bit more complex. We're gonna say PP valid two is greater than the request date. or pp valid two is null. And then we need to set these parameters. So set parameter, and this one is product. And so that will be the product object which is getting passed in. And then the next parameter will be the request date which is also being passed in. And then to finish off, we say get query and then get result. Okay, so hopefully that made sense. We're doing, doing an inner join on the product promotions table. If a product or if that product can be found, if it can be joined on that product and also where PP valid two. So I noticed I've got a comma in there that needs to be a, a dot. So PP valid two is greater than the request date or PP valid two is null. And here we're just setting the parameters and then performing the query. Let's go back to our controller and we'll actually dump this out just to make sure that it's actually working. Okay, so in Postman we'll fire off the request. Okay, and so we're getting an array which contains two items. So we have the Black Friday half price sale promotion, and we also have the voucher OU812. So let's test this fully and we'll test the different combinations. So if we actually change this valid two date to one which is before the request date, so I've got request date 4th of 4th, 2022 there. Let's just change this to uh, first of the first 2022 and that should cover it and so this time we going by the rules that we've set we should only get one back which will be this one here which is null let's fire this off okay so we have an array with one item and that is the voucher because the rule being 
Uh, if valid 2 is null, then it means that that promotion is still valid. Let's change them both to null. And so this time again, we should see 2. Okay, and so this time we get 2 back. So that's all working. Let's actually go and change this back to what it was before, 2022, 11, 28, meaning the end of the Black Friday sale. And then fire it off again. And so now we're back to two promotions. So that's all querying taken care of. In the next one, what we'll do is we'll go and pass the data into our promotions filter and we'll look at ways in which we can add a bit of strictness to make sure that our promotions is an array uh, which contains only promotion objects. In this one, we'll have a look at passing our promotions into the promotions filter apply method and we'll think about how we can apply some uh, type safety there. And then what we'll do is we'll have a little bit of a tidy up, make sure that everything that we've got so far is working the way that we want it to and uh, is being returned in the format that we want it to before we actually go and work on this uh, promotions filter apply method, which is going to be really where a lot of all the more complex logic takes place. So before we get into that, I just want to make sure that everything else is all taken care of first. So we know that here, if we get some promotions back, it's going to be in an array format. And then we're going to pass that into the apply method. But how do we actually apply some type safety to make sure that our array only contains promotions? Performing this query here that we know that we're actually going to get back promotion entities or null. Okay, we know that that works. However, we should, apply, we should approach this with the mindset of this unit working in isolation without thinking of what's been passed in, how can we make sure that this unit will always only work if it's passed an array of promotion objects. And so in PHP currently at the time of recording, there's nothing actually built in which where you can enforce an array of a particular type of object. However, there are workarounds which you can use. And so let me show you how we can do that. We can use variadic arguments. What does that mean? So here for the second argument, so we'll start out with the interface. We can say promotion. And then if we use the three dots and then promotion like that, we can pass it as a variadic argument. And so we need to go and do the same thing to our lowest price filter. So here as the second argument, promotion, dot, 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 promotion. And then the final piece of the jigsaw is to go where it's actually being invoked. So in our product, in our promotions or product products controller, messing my words up there, we just need to do the same thing. So here, dot, dot, dot. So what will happen is it'll get unpacked into single promotions and then packed back up into an array of promotion objects. So in Postman, let's fire off a request and see what happens. Okay, so I've got a 500 internal server error and it's saying a circular reference has been detected when serializing the object of class product. Okay, back to our code. So we only serialize uh, anything here, which is on line 57 of our products controller. And it says we're trying to serialize a product and that we're getting a circular reference. Let's go and look at our product. And so the problem really lies here, where we have a product and then it's making a reference to product promotions, but a product promotion then makes a reference back to product. And so we're not actually using this. So we can go for a quick win here by actually just removing this. Because if you remember what we did, we actually said we're going to use the product promotion uh, in the promotion entity, but, we, but we've not actually used it here. Uh, and so let's just comment out this reference for the time being, and we'll go and find all references to it. We'll comment it out, see if that makes things work, and then we can come back and delete it later on if we definitely don't need it. There are other ways to get around this, but I've thought that seeing as we don't actually need this, and it looks like we're not going to use it, we might as well just get rid of this. Okay, so let's go back to Postman. We'll send our request. Okay, and so this time it looks like we are getting uh, no errors. Let's convert this to JSON 
Um, you'll notice that we're getting our response back in HTML format and I'm having to click this and convert it to JSON every time. The reason for that is because when we uh, changed from using the JSON response, we don't automatically get the content type set to application JSON. And so what we need to do is as a third argument, in fact, we're going to have a look at the response just to show you this. The third argument to the response constructor is an array of headers. And here you can set the response content type. So let's add an array here, content type. You'll see I'm getting some auto completion because I'm using the Symfony plugin. Uh, and this will be application JSON. Okay, so let's go and send another response, another request, sorry, and see if that has fixed it. Uh, so this time you'll see that we're automatically getting JSON back. But what you will have noticed is that since we started adding the product to the DTO, to our inquiry DTO, we're now getting the product back as an object in the response body, which I don't really want. It doesn't conform to the uh, API which we specified at the beginning, and so I'd prefer for that not to be there. We need to come up with a solution to get rid of this. One solution is to actually choose which fields should get serialized and which fields shouldn't, or in our case, we just want to choose one which we don't want to be serialized. And so there's a very quick and easy way to solve this. We can just go over to our lowest price inquiry and on our product, we can just say ignore. So here you'll see Symphony Component Serializer Annotation Ignore. However, I don't think this is going to work just yet. I think we're going to have to go and uh, update our DTO. But let's go and run it anyway. As you can see, the product object is still there. So we still have one more step. If we go over to our DTO serializer, what we can do is where we pass in this argument to the object normalizer here, we can also pass in an argument for uh, reading the metadata on our objects which are serialized. And so here as the first argument, we'll have a class metadata factory, which will be a new class metadata factory. And then we need to tell it how it should read the metadata because you have different types of metadata. You can specify it in different ways. We've used annotations, so we need something which can read annotations. But this can also be done with XML, and I believe it can also be done with YAML. But we're going to use annotations, and so we need new annotation loader and then new annotation reader. And so when it's normalizing and denormalizing to and from objects, what it'll do is it's going to read the metadata. We've said we want you to look at annotations to read the metadata on those classes, on those objects, and then uh, do what you need to do that way. Which now means if we go back to our lowest price inquiry, we've specified our metadata using annotations like so. So hopefully this little ignore uh, annotation that we've put here should be read. We should be able to go to Postman and send the request and hopefully that product object will now have gone. Okay, perfect. We've now got everything in a nice state for us to be able to start working on this apply method, which is going to be uh, logically maybe a bit more complex than the stuff we've already done. And so I think we might drive out the functionality using tests. But before that, I just want to add another note in here because if you remember what we said about promotions, if none are found in the database, then that means that this is going to give us null. However, our method here isn't going to handle null because we've said that it can only be an array of promotion objects. And so what we're going to need to do is put some handling in here in case we get null back. Because if there are no promotions, then there's probably no point actually calling the apply method or taking the process any further. If there are no promotions, then we can't really do anything or send anything back, which is of any relevance to the user. And so maybe at that point, we'll actually send a response back. In this one, we're going to start to have a look at the mechanics of applying the filtering to our data using the promotion. So basically our promotions filter apply method 
which we see here. So at the moment, as you can see, all we did was we just hard-coded in some values so that we're always returning something when we actually contact this service. And so we can continue uh, working the way we are, where we're making requests from Postman and putting data in the database. However, I don't think that would be an efficient way to work. I think the best way to drive this out where we're not having to go and look in databases and look in Postman and other uh, tools is just to write a test and then we can just keep firing the test and just making the changes as we go along. So we're going to take a bit of a test driven approach on this. And so let's go over and actually start uh, writing our first test or thinking about what testing tools we need. As this is a service, I'm thinking we're probably going to need access to things like uh, the ability to mimic making requests. I think we're probably going to need entity manager interfaces, uh, containers. And so what I'm going to do is set up a uh, like a base test class, which provides all of those things for us should we need them. And so I'll just call it service test case. Okay, and so should we need to uh, mimic making requests into our application? Obviously, we're not going to need to do that for unit testing the filter apply method, but it is something which we might need. And also, uh, I can get I can generate a client off which I can grab a container. So what we'll do is we'll extend web test case, and then in the setup method, I'll obtain a container. But first off, let's just add it here so container interface which is symphony component dependency injection container interface and we'll just call it container so this container equals static create client and then get container and then I'll extend this class for any tests which might need access to a client, which I can use to mimic HTTP requests, or if I need containers or any other little bits of setup, such as entity managers, things like that. Okay, so in tests, now I'm gonna create a folder called unit. And then we need a lowest price filter test. which extends service test case. In here, I'm gonna add a test method called lowest price promotions filtering is applied correctly. And so I'll just go and annotate this as a test. And then, so I'll mark out the three stages of the test. So I'll go with given, when, then. And then what I'm gonna do here is I'm actually gonna work backwards because by working backwards, that'll indicate to me which what setup I need and what actions need to actually be performed and what the dependencies are to perform those actions. But first, if I start with the outcome, then I think it'll help guide me. So let's go over to the lowest price filter and see what kind of things we're expecting here. And so if um, this filter had been applied and the Black Friday sale was the one which generated the lowest price, then we'd expect to see a discounted price, uh, of 50, a set price of 100, and a promotion name of Black Friday sale. Not too concerned with checking a promotion ID because uh, that is a value which is generated by adding a record in the database. So we'll not bother with that. What I will do though is I'll just go and copy some of this over here and I'll use that to guide me. And so just behind the scenes, I'm gonna create some little test assertions using these things. So those are the assertions which I've come up with. Uh, this assert same 100 inquiry get price, this assert same 50 inquiry get discounted price, and this assert same Black Friday half price sale inquiry get promotion name. And so as you can see, this is already indicating to me what my dependencies are in order to get to this point. I'm actually going to need an inquiry. Where does my inquiry come from? It actually gets returned from the lowest price filter. And this will be the when part of the test. So this is the actual action which is being performed. This is where we're calling the apply method on the lowest 
price filter. So inquiry equals, and we're going to need a lowest price filter. And so you probably have spotted that we don't actually have one of those yet. And we're calling an apply method on it. And so what are the arguments? Let's go and check this out. So it's going to need uh, an inquiry. So the same kind of inquiry object and then it's going to need an array of promotions so things are getting quite interesting here so here we'll say inquiry and then we're going to need an array of promotions and if you remember in order to unpack those we need our three dots like so and so we still don't actually have a initial inquiry in order to pass it into this method and we don't have the promotions and we don't have the lowest price filter. Before I create those though what I think I'll do is I'm going to make a distinction between the inquiry even though it's the same object which comes out of the apply method and the inquiry goes in because now it will have been filtered. So what I'll do is I'll call this filtered inquiry. Now I can change the names of these Okay, great. So let's work our way through these. We'll go from left to right. I think we should be able to do that. So first off, lowest price filter. Where can I get one of those from? If you remember, uh, when we did our service test case, we have access to the container. And so because it is in the source folder, it means it automatically gets added to the container. I can grab it simply by just passing the name of it. So like this, lowest price filter equals this container get, and then lowest price filter class. And we should now have access to a lowest price filter. Let's actually go and dump this out just to prove that that is working. So vendor bin PHP unit tests unit lowest price filter test let's run this and so i'm getting some deprecation notices and i'm getting this message here about the lowest price inquiry json serialize method so we don't actually need the json serialize method on the lowest price inquiry anymore i think what i'll do is i'll just go and remove that so that was Still some hangover when I was showing you how you could uh, serialize objects doing things uh, uh, that way using the um, serializable interface, but we decided we're not going to do that. We're actually uh, physically serializing our objects using the Symfony serializer. So this implements promotion and query interface. Let's follow that and we'll actually remove this where it extends JSON serializable. Let's go back to our test and run it again and see what it tells us next. Okay, so it's just the one deprecation notice and there's a way in which you can get rid of deprecation notices if you don't want to see those when you run your tests. We simply have to go to our uh, PHP unit XML dist file and you just need to drop this line in which I add here. So env name equals symphony underscore deprecations underscore helper and then set the value to disabled. And then now if we go and run the tests... So as you can see, we're now getting a app filter, lowest price filter from the container. Okay, great stuff. So we know we have a lowest price filter. That's great. Let's work our way upwards. Next, we'll add an inquiry. So inquiry equals new lowest price inquiry. That should take care of that. And then we need some promotions. I'm going to drop these underneath here. So where are we actually going to get some promotions from? What I'm going to do is I'm just going to create three new promotion objects and then wrap those in an array. So I'll not add them here because it means that this test method could become uh, quite large and unwieldy and hard to read. What I'll do is I'll create a method underneath this, like a data provider, but not an official data provider, but it will give me the option to use it as a data provider later on if I uh, decide to set out that way. So I'll call it this, promotions data provider. 
Okay, and then obviously we need to go and create that. And so if I am later going to use it as a proper uh, data provider, then it needs to be public. So we'll start out the way we may continue. So public function. This is going to return an array. And then just behind the scenes, because I'm sure you don't want to see me type out three entire uh, objects with all the properties. I'll just create three um, promotion objects and then add some properties to them. This is what I've come up with. So the top one should seem quite familiar to you because that's what we created in the database. So the name Black Friday half price sale, the adjustment will be 0.5, i.e. multiply by 0.5. The criteria is that the request date must fall between this range and then the type of modification, the type of filtering is going to be a uh, date range multiplier. Then the next one we said was going to be a fixed price voucher and so uh, setting it to a fixed price of 100 if the voucher code is OU812 and again the modification type is fixed price voucher and just off the top of my head I've invented a new one here as well buy one get one free I think I want to take the uh, number of even items and multiply that by 0.5 and then maybe add on um, just a regular price for any odd items or for the single odd item after that. If that makes sense, I'm sure it'll make more sense once we get to figuring this out. And so at the bottom here, what I want to do is just return an array of promotion 1, promotion 2 and promotion 3. Okay, so we now have three promotions, and as you can see, PHP Storm's now happy with us. It's not giving us the squiggly red line, and I think I should be able to run this test now and see how we're getting on. So, like I say, very happy path. This is all really just to make sure that we have all our dependencies, or most of our dependencies, in order to be able to start driving out the functionality any, anyway, at least. So, vendor bin PHP unit tests, unit lowest price filter test. Okay, we get one test, three assertions. Why did we get three assertions? Because in the lowest price filter, those are the values which were hard coded. So, we set the price to 100, the discounted price to 50, and the name to Black Friday half price sale. So, if I was to change one of these to 51, we should now get a failure. And so we get a failure, failed asserting that 51 is identical to 50. So we'll just go and change that back. Having a test like this, which we can keep running uh, as we're updating the logic in our lowest price filter, should serve us quite well. We can just go in, make our little tweaks, run the tests, and we're not going over to use other tools like Postman. We're not having to check databases as we just do little tweaks to our logic, we can run the test, see if we're still passing and make our changes that way. And I think it should be a nice slick workflow. If you appreciate the value in being able to test your code well, then make sure you check out my course, Testing PHP. It consists of many hours of material which covers unit testing, feature testing and integration testing. There's loads of stuff on faking and mocking, how to test code which interacts with external services. There's a long section on test driven development and I'm continuously adding to the course as I uncover new tools and techniques. You'll love it. In this one we're going to start figuring out our promotions filtering logic and so it's really just going to be like a discovery phase. We're going to figure out uh, what dependencies we might need which we don't currently have, what do we currently have which might need changing and what do we currently have which is going to help us achieve our goals. And so I've come up with a handful of steps uh, which should make it fairly simple to follow and so what I've come up with so far is we're going to loop over the promotions and then we need to apply the promotions logic against the inquiry and so I'm thinking these two steps are sort of related really we're going to need to check does the promotion apply so for example if you think about the one where we said for the Black Friday sale is the request date within the date range or if you think about the uh, the other scenario we came up with where we're looking at a voucher code, does the voucher code uh, match what is actually found in the inquiry? And then we need to, if those uh, conditions evaluate to true, then we need to apply the price modification logic. And so I'm thinking those two steps 
can probably be related and I'm thinking we'll come up with some kind of modifier class which will actually perform that logic for us. It'll check if it's uh, if it's valid, if it's making a valid modification and then it'll actually perform the modification to come up with a modified price. And so what I'm thinking of doing there is I want it to return a modified price and so what do I want to return a modified price? And so I'm thinking of having like just a modifier class, a price modifier class. So price modifier modify, and then it's gonna need some pieces of information. So this is all just rough at the moment, just figuring stuff out. So it's gonna need a price, definitely. It's gonna need a quantity and it will also need the promotion because if we remembered the promotion let's go over to our test then that is what contains the logic so we call it criteria and it, it also knows how much to uh, perform the adjustment by and so we will definitely need the promotion and then if you think about how these things are going to work uh, if we're looking at Black Friday sale then we're going to need to know the request date and then if we're looking at voucher codes we're going to need to know the voucher code so even though the price and the quantity can be found on the inquiry. I'm thinking still pass the inquiry in anyway, just for these edge cases where you might need to check a voucher code, you might need to check a request date. Then once all that logic has been performed, we're gonna have a modified price. And so we need to check that modified price against the, the current lowest price. And if the modified price is lower than the current lowest price, then that's when we're gonna uh, do these things here. We're gonna set the new price, uh, set the discounted price and set the actual promotion name. And we'll also update the lowest price to what is now uh, the modified price. Let's think about the parts that we've just added there which we don't currently have. So price modifier, I'm thinking of having a factory class which will go and get the modifier based upon the detail that we have here so the type uh, the type value in the promotion so for example I'll have a fixed price voucher modifier class which just handles uh, modifying prices for fixed price vouchers then we have price I know I can get that off the inquiry so that's quite easy and the quantity can also come off the inquiry so we'll go and get those things price equals inquiry and the price actually comes off the product. So something which immediately springs to mind there is we're asking quite a lot of the supply method. We're saying that we're expecting whatever inquiry gets passed into this to have access to a product. And if you think about a promotion inquiry interface, it's really quite vanilla, isn't it? It's very abstract. So... Uh, early indication there that we're probably going to need to go for something a little bit more specific. We don't actually need any functionality, so I'm not thinking abstract class. I'm thinking maybe we're going to need to extend this with something a bit more specific to our needs. So maybe something like a price inquiry interface. And then our inquiry would implement that instead. But we'll not get too far ahead on that stuff. Don't think too far ahead. I'm still going to stay fairly abstract. I'm going to look at where I'm at after I've added all the other bits and then make the decision there. Because if I start making decisions early, then it will reduce my options, I think. So keep your options open. Uh, stay nice and abstract until you, be need, until you definitely know that you need to be more sp specific and you know more what the details of those specifics are. So let's just keep going for the time being and we can leave a few sins in there. What I want next is a quantity. So quantity equals inquiry get quantity. Again, exactly the same issue we have here. We're saying that we're expecting any inquiry which gets passed in here to have a quantity field. And then what we're gonna to need to do is we're gonna need a starting lowest price. So for the first pass, we're gonna need something which needs to be compared against it. What is gonna be the starting lowest price? Well, it's actually going to be the quantity multiplied by the price. Thank you. 
and then each time once the modified price is obtained that is just checked against the current lowest price and then again if the modified price is then less than the lowest price then the lowest price gets updated to the modified price okay so what next we actually have quite a heavy dependency here don't we because in order for this to work we are dependent on having uh, price modifiers and being able to actually uh, obtain those modifiers using a factory so i'm thinking what we'll do is we'll actually go and create our price modifiers and test those first so what we're looking at is this we're going to need one for a date range multiplier one for a fixed price voucher and one for an even items multiplier for things like buy one get one free buy one get one half price that kind of stuff so we'll actually go and create those modifiers and test those and then we'll come back and figure out how we can fit them in and how to obtain them using a factory so in order to keep the wheels moving, in order to still be able to return a response, let's comment that line out because we don't have that dependency yet. And let's just go and run this, run our tests and see what's happening. So vendor bin PHP unit tests unit lowest price filter test. Okay, and so it's saying error typed property, lowest price inquiry product must not be accessed before initialization. Okay, so it's helping us uh, drive out our test dependencies still here. So what we actually need is we need to pass a product into our lowest price inquiry. So let's create a product. And of course, we know that we're going to need a price for that. And so I think we'll set the price to 100 for uh, each product and then what we're going to need is to set the product on the inquiry so inquiry set product product let's go and run this again okay and so now it's saying uh, typed property lowest price inquiry quantity must not be accessed before initialization so inquiry set quantity we'll set the quantity to five and so thinking about this five times 100 will be 500 and if we're applying a half price sale the discounted price will now be 250 and so price thinking about this you'd think maybe we should set the price to 500 but really uh, initially I wanted price to mean the price of an individual item so we'll keep that how it is even though it looks a bit strange that the discounted price is actually more than what the price is um, but let's not overthink that we can leave things as they are I think we might need to go and change our filter here so we'll actually run the test first and we should get a test failure now I think so I failed asserting that 50 is identical to 250 so we're not actually getting any errors saying that we don't have parts now this is actual a test failure so all i need to do is set the discounted price to 250 and this should be a green i think okay so everything is still working we're still returning the same or similar data from our lowest price filter and we've also figured out the logic that we're going to need in order for this to work so we're in a good position we can move on figure out how we're going to make our modifiers work and how we're going to be able to obtain them within the filter and then we should be able to put the final pieces together on this let's now go and start to create our price modifiers in the last one if you remember we decided what we're going to do is we're going to have a modifier for each of these types so here we have a promotion uh, for the black friday half price sale and in order to modify the price we're going to create a modifier called date range multiplier so it'll be a single class with a single responsibility to modify the price based on this criteria which we see here and then we'll create one for fixed price voucher which should be uh, fairly straightforward and then we'll create one for even items multiplier which could be quite interesting and get into some interesting code and so let's make a start in our uh, tests unit folder let's create a new test and we'll call it price modifiers test this will need to extend service test case 
And so let's create our first test and we shall call it date range multiplier returns a correctly modified price. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start at the end again. And so what is the end? If we remember where we were on the previous uh, recording, the lowest price filter, we said that we wanted to have a price modifier with a modify method uh, which returns the modified price. So we shall copy that and we'll go and paste that in here. In fact, we'll do it in the when part because that is the action that we're performing. And so then the assertion we want to make is that the modified price uh, matches a specified price. So this assert equals and we'll say 250 and then modified price. So now that we've established what our desired outcome is, we want to be able to call this method on this modifier and expect this result. We can now go and piece together all the dependencies which can help us uh, achieve that aim. So the first thing we're going to need if we work left to right is we're going to need a price modifier. And in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to give it the name of the modifier that we're going to go with. So this will be a date range modifier. And so date range modifier equals new date range modifier. Obviously that doesn't exist yet. So uh, that's something which we're going to need to create. The price, we'll actually drop that in there. We'll say 100. So 100 multiplied by five, because this, this is going to be a Black Friday half price sale. 100 multiplied by five should give us 500. And then if it's been um, multiplied by 0.5, then we should get an answer of 250. Okay, so what we're going to need now, we're going to need a promotion. So let's go to our other test and we'll borrow that one here so we can grab all of this and just drop that in there. And I'll just change the name to promotion. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. This is uh, our promotion entity, which is getting passed into the modify method. And as you can see, it's got all the details there for a date range multiplier. And then we need an inquiry. New lowest price inquiry. And on this, we're going to need a quantity, even though I've actually just dropped it in there anyway, we've hard coded it, but we'll go through the motions anyway, and inquiry will need the request date because uh, this is entirely dependent on uh, dependent on the rest date falling between these from and to dates here. So we need something in the middle of there. Let's go with 2022, 11, 27. That should fit the bill. And so if we go and run this now, I'm expecting to see an error to say that we don't have a date range multiplier. But let's not guess what's going to happen. Let's just do it and we might be surprised. It might come up with something else. So vendor bin PHP unit tests unit price modifiers test.php. Okay, and so just as we thought, error class app tests unit date range modifier not found. So we need to go and create that date range modifier and we need to decide where it's going to live. So if we go to our lowest price filter, that is in a folder called filter. I think we can put another folder inside of there with modifiers. And I've said filter using uh, singular, so we'll say modifier using singular, not that it really matters. And I think we'll have an interface because each of our uh, modifiers are going to need to have this modify method and hopefully should have the same interface, the same arguments. So let's actually comment that back out and we'll go and create it with that signature. So inside of our modify folder, our modifier, we'll create an interface. We'll call this price modifier interface. And so just a single method modify, which will take an int price, int quantity. We said that the next argument will be a promotion, 
a promotion inquiry interface. So again, this is likely to change. We're likely to go with something a little bit more specific, maybe a price inquiry interface, but let's not think too far ahead. And we'll just say inquiry for now. And then that will be an integer. So I'll just drop that there. Okay, so it's taking a price as an integer, quantity as an integer, a promotion object and an inquiry object. And we're gonna return an integer, which will be the price or the newly modified price. So now in the same folder, I can create my date range multiplier. Date range multiplier implements price modifier interface. So I'll get the red squiggly line and in PHP Storm, I can hit Alt and Enter and it'll give me the option to add the method stub. So I'll hit Enter again and then hit enter again. And so we have a empty modify method. So we now have a date range multiplier. I think we can go back and run our test and let it tell us what to do next. So first off, I'm just gonna make sure that I am actually pulling in that date range modifier. In fact, I'd called it date range modifier, but what it was meant to be called was date range multiplier. So date range multiplier. Okay, so let's go and run this test. And so our next error is a type error, app filter modifier, date range multiplier, modify, return value must be of type int non returned. So we're expecting uh, the result to be 250. So let's just go and hard code that in. And that should give us a green. Okay, so one test, one assertion even though we've just hard coded that in, but at least we know that now we are on the right track. How will we arrive at 250? Let's just um, put some comments in there. So it will be price multiplied by quantity, and then that will be multiplied by the promotion adjustment. So multiplied by like so. So I think we can just give that a go now. So price multiplied by quantity, and then multiply by promotion, get adjustment. So hopefully that should arrive at a value of 250 again. So let's go and run this once more. Okay, one test, one assertion, we still getting 250. So far, so good. What do we need to consider now? So now we know how to calculate it, but we need to think about the criteria. So is, this is what we're going to return if everything goes well or if the date does fall in the particular range. However, what if the date does not fall in the particular range? What do we need to do then? Well, we simply miss out this bit. We don't uh, multiply it by the adjustment. We should return price times quantity. So let's just start figuring that out. And it's gonna be if the date doesn't, uh, doesn't fall within the particular range, so we'll just say, if false for the time being. And then what we're gonna do is return price multiplied by quantity. The easiest way for me to figure out logic like this a lot of the time is to actually figure out what is true. So if the date does fall in between those dates and that would look something like this. If the request date is greater or equal to from and the request date is less than two. And so in order to change that to a negative, I'll just negate it like so. Obviously this is not gonna work yet because we need to figure out what these values are going to be or how we're going to get these values. Let's work on that now. So request date equals, and we'll create a date and what we're creating it from, it comes from promotion, get request date. In fact, it comes from inquiry, get request date. From, I'm gonna do a similar thing, date create. And this time it will come from promotion, get criteria, and it will be from. And then two, I'll just copy that. And then it will be uh, promotion get criteria two. So when I get to stages like this, I like to just dump things out and make sure that I am seeing values and seeing the correct values uh, before I go any further. So DD request date, DD from, and also two. 
So let's actually go and run this. Okay, so the request date, I'm getting 27th of the 11th. From, I'm getting 25th of the 11th. And to, we're getting 28th of the 11th. So that's working fine. I can go and uh, remove that dump. And then I think we should now see a passing test. Let's go and run this. Okay, great stuff. One test, one assertion. So little sanity check. Let's go back to our test. And we'll actually change this date so it's outside of the range. And we should then see it fail. And then in which case it won't be multiplied by 0.5, we should get 500 here. So we should get a failing test telling us that 250 does not match 500. Let's go and run this. Okay, perfect. Failed asserting that 500 matches expected 250. So our next mission is to figure out uh, the similar logic or the similar thing for a fixed price voucher, which I think that's going to be fairly straightforward. So what I'm going to do is just add that behind the scenes and talk you through it because we're just simply checking a code and returning a fixed uh, price amount. In the date range multiplier test, we're just going to change this back so we're not getting the failing test there. And then I'll talk you through what I've done with the fixed price voucher test. So as you can see, very similar to the one we did for the date range multiplier. So fixed price voucher returns a correctly modified price. Uh, I've created a fixed price voucher and then we have the promotion. So this time the difference is that the uh, type is fixed price voucher. The criteria is an array of code with a value of OU812 and the adjustment is going to be a fixed adjustment. So if the uh, voucher applies, um, then you just set a fixed price of 100. So I've got a name which isn't that important. Uh, and then same again here, lowest price inquiry, and I've set a voucher code this time, whereas the distinguishing part on the date range multiplier was the actual uh, request date. And so here um, for modify, uh, because if I set it to 100, then it wouldn't actually make any difference because 100 times 5 would be 500 anyway. So what I've done is set this to 150, 150 times 5 will be 750, but we're setting it to uh, 100 if the voucher applies, five times 100 is 500. Let's go and look at the fixed price voucher. So a bit smaller than the last one because it's very simple here. It's just checking, um, checking the negation. So if the voucher code does not match the promotion uh, code, then simply return price times quantity. However, if it does match, then you're returning the adjustment, which is the uh, fixed price in this case, multiplied by the quantity. So in other words, you will be returning 100 multiplied by five in our scenario. So let's go and run this test. And so as you can see, we now get two tests and two assertions. We'll take a pause there because I think the even items multiplier might be a little bit more involved and I don't want these videos to get too long. If you're enjoying this workflow and you like this test driven approach and you'd like to know more about testing PHP, then don't forget you can still check out my testing PHP uh, course. I'll leave a link in the description and also at the end of the video. In this one, we're gonna have a look at the remaining modifier, which is gonna be the even items modifier. So even though we've just looked at three and we've decided we're gonna have three different modifiers in our application, in reality, if you're building something like this, you could end up with like literally hundreds of these things, which can all do different kinds of calculations and ways of uh, reducing the price. But we've just stuck with three and I've sort of split it down so that the videos don't get too long. So this is the last one and this is the even items multiplier. So uh, just behind the scenes, I'm gonna actually paste in the test uh, and then just talk you through it and then we'll work through the actual uh, modifier itself together. So this is what I've come up with. The test runs pretty much the same as the others. Uh, this is the promotion. It's going to be buy one, get one free. And so we'll be doing uh, a multiplication by 0.5, but it's going to be only on even multiples. Uh, you'll see what I mean by that when we get to it. Uh, so if it's going to be buy one, get one free, then your criteria, the only criteria I've come up with is that there must be a minimum quantity of two. And so the type is going to be even items multiplier. I'll need an even items multiplier class, which we don't yet have. 
and then uh, this is the modifier line just the same as the other um, modifier lines that we have in there so that's the action which is being performed and then we're asserting that it should equal 300 so if we have a hundred of these let's actually go and type this out in the comments so we're only you can only get the buy one get one free on even multiples what do I mean by that it means that the 100 if there's five of them will only apply to four and the fifth one you'd have to pay a full price for so 100 multiplied by four and then that will be multiplied by uh, the adjustment which is 0 0.5 and then that will be added onto the number of odd items which of course will be just one multiplied by the full price so one times 100 so 100 times 4 times 0 0.5 comes to 200 uh, and then add that to 1 plus 100 for the uh, item which can't be uh, half price and so you get a total of 300 so let's go and create that modifier and so in the filter modifier we need to create a new class called even items multiplier and that will implement price modifier interface and so we need to add the modify method and so the first check here will check the criteria and so if quantity is less than two then we just need to return price times by quantity next we need to figure out this part here so what is our highest even number in order to do that first off I'm gonna get I'm gonna check if there is an odd item and I can do this by saying odd count equals and we'll say quantity and then we can use modulo 2 and so this will either be 0 or 1 and so I'll just drop a comment in at the top here get the odd item if there is one and then using that it should be quite easy to get the even count because the even count will be the quantity minus the odd count so here we're going to deduct either 0 or 1 because that is what the odd count is so if it's already an even number or if quantity modulus 2 is already an even number then would be deducting 0 because in this case odd count will be 0 but if there is a remainder it can only be 1 and so here we would be deducting that 1 in order to give us the even count so what we're doing here is we're just counting how many even items there are and so going back to that formula which we came up with here basically what we're doing there is this we're saying even count multiplied by price multiplied by the adjustment plus the odd count multiplied by the price and so let's return that And so that should give us 300. Let's return back to our test and run it. First off, we need to make sure that we are pulling in this even items multiplier. So that, if we go to the top of our file here, that is coming from app filter modifier even items multiplier. Vendor bin PHP unit test unit price modifiers test. And we get three tests three assertions perfect so if I set this adjustment to something completely different then this time we should see a failing test and indeed we do see a failing test so let's take this one step further just to show uh, to demonstrate really why I decided to do this like this because you might see uh, some developers will get something like this your your mission is to create a modifier for buy one get one free and that is all that it will do they'll just come up with a modifier which will can, can only work as buy one get one free but I decided to go down this route of having uh, this particular 
uh, multiplication logic and filtering out the odd count because it gives you that flexibility to be able to do other things such as buy one get one half price so again if you fancy that challenge if you want to have a go at this before me create yourself a new test uh, it'll be hitting the exact same modifier just figure out what you need to do to make this uh, return buy one get one half price you might be surprised at just how easy and just how little you need to change so uh, I'll go and have a go at that now what I shall do is I'll just copy this test now we need to give it a different name so um, we'll say correctly calculates buy one uh, get one half price uh, so in fact I decided to call it something else because uh, that other name was a bit too long so even items multiplier correctly calculates alternatives. I've changed the name here to buy one, get one half price. Before I change anything else, let's just go and figure out what the maths should be. So according to my maths, I think we should get uh, 300 plus the 100. So these will be uh, the ones that fall into the get one, uh, buy one, get one half price. And then because we have uh, five items, then we should have the one item at full price. And so we should get a uh, total of 400. In order to get to that, we, we, the only thing we actually need to do is just change the adjustment to 0 0.75. And so there, you can see just how flexible this is. You literally just change the adjustment and you can do all kinds of different offers. So uh, let's actually go and run this now. And so now we get four tests for assertions. And so that completes the work that we're going to do on our modifiers. What we need to do now is actually go back to our lowest price filter. And this is the line that we've been using in our tests. Modify price equals price modifier modify. And then we're passing in these arguments. But we hadn't established where we're going to get this price modifier. How is it going to find its way in here? How are we going to select the correct price modifier for each kind of promotion? And so what we need to do is we need to come up with some kind of factory which is going to generate us our price modifier. And that's what we're going to work on next. Now that we've created three price modifiers, we need to figure out a way of how we're going to get them into our lowest price filter. And so what we're going to do is we're going to create a factory class uh, which will do the work for us. So here we are in the lowest price filter and what we want to achieve is we want to get this price modifier. And so the thing, uh, what I'm thinking of doing is something along these lines. Price modifier equals and we can create a factory which we can inject. So this price modifier factory and then on that factory, we'll just have one simple method called create. And so what information does it need in order to create a price modifier? Let's go back to the lowest price filter test. And here where we've got our promotions data provider, basically what it needs in order to create it, it just needs to know what type of modifier. And so it will be the type property on the promotion. Before we can do that, we need to set up our loop. So we want it to loop over the promotions. Just going to change the name of the parameter to promotions. We'll make that plural. And then here, I'm going to say for each promotions as promotion, opening curly, and then we'll close it just after where we set those um, values on the inquiry. Okay, so. Here we can now say create using promotion get type. And then what we need to do is we need to somehow get this price modifier factory. So let's go to the top here and I'll create a constructor. And so we've sort of established a contract, haven't we? We've said that it's going to have one method and that will be create. So let's actually inject a price modifier factory interface obviously we don't have that yet but we can work ahead so private price modifier factory interface and so that can live in filter modifier we'll create a folder in there called factory 
and then inside of the factory folder we'll create a new uh, this will be an interface price modifier factory interface and like we say this is just going to have a create method and that will be a string and that will be the name of the modifier type and this is going to return a price modifier interface okay so hopefully that makes sense we've created a price modifier factory interface it has uh, one method which must be implemented by an implementing class so let's go and create one of those now so here we'll create a concrete price modifier factory Of course this will implement the price modifier factory interface and so that means that we also must do must implement that create method and let's think about how this is going to work so first of all we need to take this uh, string which comes in snake case if we go back to lowest price filter test uh, we have these snake case modifier names and we need to convert those to class names which are in Pascal case and so we'll say modifier class base name equals. So doing this one step at a time, first thing we need to do is we need to uppercase the words. So you see words, the string will be the modifier type and then the separator. And so our words are separated with underscores. And then what we need to do is pass that into a replacer which will replace these underscores with empty spaces or it will just remove those underscores and so we can do that with string replace str replace and so the first argument is what we are replacing which is underscores then what we replacing it with which is nothing we're basically getting rid of it and then the third argument is the actual string so I need to remember our parentheses on the end there so hopefully that should be working okay and we'll just correct this typo here so modify our class base name and what we'll need to do is append that to the namespace for the modifiers so I think what I'm going to do is go back to the price modifier factory interface and I'll actually just create a constant there so price modifier namespace equals and the modifiers are in app filters modifiers so two backslashes on the end there and then let's go back to our price modifier factory and we'll just append those two things together in order to get us the modifier name so price modifier namespace appended with modifier class base name that should give us our modifier and then what we really need to do is check that that class exists because you could have scenarios where maybe this has been set up in the database, they've added a new type, but no modifiers have actually been created in PHP yet. That's quite a common uh, thing to happen. So we need to just make that check that there is an actual modifier class in place to do the work. And if not, we need to throw an exception which can be handled somewhere. And so if not class exists, modifier, then what can we throw? What I'm thinking of doing is just as a temporary measure, uh, grabbing something which is built into Symfony. Um, all the main error handling, I'm gonna leave it till the end of the series because for the main reason that error handling, for whatever reason, isn't very popular on YouTube. People just wanna do all the sexy stuff. So uh, if we leave that stuff to the end, then the hardcore people that want to do error handling can uh, watch it and those that don't, I'm not gonna inter interrupt their enjoyment. And so here there is something called class not found exception which comes from symphony component var exporter exception so we'll throw that in for now and the way this works is I can just pass it the class name and it will actually come up with an error that says class name uh, class class name not found and so that's if the class cannot be found does not exist but if there is a modifier class then all we need to do is just return that like so in fact we need to put the new word in front of that so return new modifier 
Just a quick one on comments, uh, which I've left in here like this. I've really just left them in to guide people that are watching the videos. In reality, I won't leave that noise in there because it's quite obvious what this is doing. It's building a modifier class base name. But uh, on this rare occasion, I'm gonna leave the comments in there just so that people can follow. And it just makes the videos a little easier to follow if you've got the comments in there. Let's now go back to our lowest price filter and see where we're at. So we can get our price modifier factory interface like so and then what I'm thinking of doing is just dumping this out and making sure that we do now get a price modifier that our factory is working okay so DD price modifier and then all I need to do is just go back to the test and run this so we're looking for lowest price filter test And so at least we know that our class not found exception is working okay, but I must have made some mistake here. So it's saying class app filters modifiers date range multiplier not found. Okay, so basically the reason for that is because they are in singular and not plural. So let's go back to our uh, price modifier factory and it is a price modifier factory interface. So here where I did this, it should be app filter modifier. And then I think if we go and run our test again, that should have fixed it. Okay, great. So as you can see here, we're now getting app, filter, modifier, date, range, multiplier. And that is because this is the order that they are being uh, supplied in. So let's actually go and change this and we'll remove promotion one just to make sure that we then see one for fixed price voucher. Let's run this again. Okay, great. App filter modifier fixed price voucher. Let's remove promotion two. And so this time we should see one for even items multiplier. Okay, even items multiplier. Great. So let's just make sure that this isn't working by accident. So we'll change that to odd items multiplier. And again, we should see our class not found exception. Okay, Symphony component var exporter exception. Class not found exception, class app filter modifier, odd items multiplier not found. So this is all working nicely. Let's return this to how it was. So promotion one, promotion two, promotion three, and then we'll go back to our lowest price filter. We can remove this. And then in the next one, we should be able to actually finish off this apply method and we'll strip out some of these comments. And so it should loop over the promotions, find a price modifier for each one, and then actually create a modified price. And then what we'll need to do is do this check here to see if the modified price is less than the current lowest price. And if so, then we'll save it to the inquiry and also update at the lowest price in order for it to be available for the next iteration and so on. So I'll work on that in the next one. In this one, I'm hoping to complete happy path functionality completely. So in our lowest price filter, what I want to do is just add in the remaining parts here. We'll run the test and then what we'll go and do is we'll fire request a request into it from Postman and hopefully we should get back the data that we are expecting. So let's go and take this piece by piece and our next step is to actually check if the modified price is less than the lowest price and if so that's when we'll actually set these values and we'll remove the hard coding of these values and use the real ones so check if modified price is less than lowest price if you remember we we established the lowest price at the top here or a starting lowest price by multiplying the quantity by price if modified price is less than lowest price then we need to grab all of this stuff and just move it into there and so our first step is to uh, set these values on the inquiry so save to inquiry properties discounted price will be the modified price the price if you remember at the top we acquired it there and so we made the decision that for the uh, price field we were going to use the actual price of an individual uh, item so I think what we can do is actually cut that from there because it's always going to be the same it isn't going to be changed by any promotions filtering so where we retrieve the price there then we'll set the price 
Okay, hopefully that made sense. Set promotion ID, so from this we can get it straight off the promotion. Get ID, and then set the promotion name. Get name. So if this promotion turns out to be the one which um, produces the lowest price, then we set the properties on the inquiry DTO. And then we need to update the lowest price for the next uh, iteration. So lowest price equals modified price. Next, what I'm actually gonna do is go over and test this. So on our lowest price filter test, Let's just go and check this out. So I'm probably expecting a couple of errors here because I don't think we have all the fields. For example, we need, we're need we gonna need a request date and voucher code. So we'll go and run it anyway. Rather than guess, I usually just run the tests and let the test tell me what the problems are. So vendor bin PHP unit tests unit lowest price filter test, hit go. So we have an error typed property uh, lowest price inquiry request date must not be accessed before initialization. So we're trying to access the request date at some point. Uh, it will be in the date range multiplier uh, before we've actually set a request date. So inquiry set request date. Uh, it needs to fall uh, within those bounds for the Black Friday half price for sale. So uh, 25th of November and the 28th of November. Let's set this to the 27th. Okay, run the tests again. And so we get another error typed property app DTO lowest price inquiry voucher code must not be accessed before initialization. So we also need one of those. Okay, let's run the tests again. And so this time we get one test three assertions. So uh, the price is being set and the discounted price is being set. How about if we went and uh, just changed the date? In fact, if we change the date so it's outside of the Black Friday sale, so if you set this to 30, it means, according to my maths, the next lowest price will be this one. Buy one, get one free. Uh, should return a price of or a discounted price of 300 so let's go and run this and so indeed it does uh, we fail to assert that 300 is identical to 250 so this time um, it's not used a Black Friday half price sale it's used the buy one get one free but we'll change that back run the tests again so that's all green. Now what I want to do is go and strip out all of these comments because um, we just put them there as guides. So don't leave comments in there, or I don't leave comments in there that just tell you what is happening. If I need to explain why or reasons for doing something, uh, then I'll do that. But it should be quite obvious what's happening here. For example, we know that we're looping over the, the promotions if we've got a for each which says uh, promotions as promotion. And this stuff here, we don't need this. It, it was just guiding us really. We know that we're checking if the modified price is less than the lowest price. So just go through, strip out all the noise. If you use good names and if you use good method names and good variable names, uh, and if it's quite clear what you're doing, such as checking uh, a certain condition, then you don't need any of that stuff. What I'll do now is just make sure that everything's up and running or I'll just get everything up and running again because uh, it's been a while since I had my server running on this and also uh, since I had uh, Docker running in my database. So I need to start those things again and just go and check that I've got all the data and everything uh, which I need for this to work. So Docker compose up hyphen D. Obviously if you've already got Docker running then you don't need to follow this step. I'll go and set this going now. Okay, great. And then I'm going to set the server running as well. So symphony server colon start hyphen D. I'm just going to get the port number for my database in Docker. So I can do Docker PS. And so here we see uh, MySQL 8. And where it says ports, I'm looking for this one here, 50915. So 
3306, that is your uh, Docker port, your container port. 50915 is the port on the host. So I'll copy that and then I'll go and uh, change the port number in my connection, test my connection and just connect to table plus. And so I'll look at my promotions. As you can see, when I create this, uh, I have the one for the Black Friday half price sale, I have the voucher code, but I don't have the even items multiplier. So buy one, get one free. And that was even underscore items underscore multiplier. Uh, the adjustment was 0.5. And then for my JSON, it was minimum quantity two. I then need to link that to the product. So here, uh, ID of three, so it will be product ID one and promotion ID three. And I'll leave the valid two as null. We'll save that. And then over in Postman here, I'm just gonna change this request date so it falls within the uh, times for the Black Friday half price sale and then I think I can fire off this request so uh, my product ID is one in the pre-request script all the values look okay there let's give this a go okay so we've got 200 back and this looks good so we get the discounted price of 250 price of 100 uh, the promotion ID and Black Friday half price sale Let's go and change this date so that it would no longer fall within the bounds of the Black Friday half price sale and see what happens when we do that. Okay, great. So now it has changed to buy one, get one free and the discount price is 300 and the promotion ID is three. So really you could say we've got a working product there, but there are still things which need sorting out. Let me give you some examples. Say for example, if I remove the request date and send this off, we get an internal server error because um, it's unable to find a request date on our lowest price inquiry. So we need to add some validation to our uh, lowest price inquiry DTO. Just gonna change this back so it's working again. I don't like to end on things that ain't working. And if we go back to our application, there's things here, for example, this uh, promotion inquiry interface, it's um, very, uh, it doesn't have much detail in there. And it also, we're making assumptions here that we can get a product off of that inquiry and that we can get a quantity off that inquiry, whereas we haven't actually enforced that. So uh, we're gonna have to change this for something a little bit more specific. And then I think what we'll do is we'll just round things off by having some uh, uniform error handling, which is the same throughout the application. So that we always have, uh, we always return the same kind of errors in the same kind of format, which makes it easy for other services to understand and to use. In this one, we're gonna have a look at the interface which we are injecting into the apply method of the lowest price filter. So there's a couple of considerations. We want to make sure that we are adhering to the solid principle of interface segregation. And we also want to take care of these assumptions that we are, we are making to say that a get product method will be available, a get quantity method will be available at set price, etc. because if we look at it at the moment, it actually has none of those methods. So something that which we definitely need to take care of. We have a test which sits underneath this so we can make our changes and just keep running the tests as we go along. So if I run lowest price filter test at the moment, we're getting one test, three assertions. Let's go and start making those changes. So like I've discussed earlier, we want to make something a little bit more specific than this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create another interface which I'll call price inquiry interface which will just be specifically for inquiries relating to price but this is a promotions engine so uh, all of our inquiry interfaces will extend the promotion inquiry interface so let's do that also and so there nothing should have changed our test should still be passing because it doesn't have any effect, we've not injected it anywhere. But what we need to do now is actually go and make that change. So here we're going to say 
instead of promotion inquiry interface, I'm going to change this to price inquiry interface. And now we'll get some uh, squiggly red line under there because our apply method here no longer um, adheres to what was specified in the promotions filter interface, which is expecting a promotion inquiry interface. So what I'm going to do here is do exactly the same thing. I'm going to create something a little bit more specific. So I'll we'll say price filter interface, which will extend promotions filter interface. And then what I'm going to do is just go and chop that method from there. So this uh, interface is now empty. Drop that into there. I'm just going to change the promotion filter interface for or promotion inquiry interface for price inquiry interface. And then if I go back to my lowest price filter, we've got some underlining here because we still haven't made the change to implement that with our lowest price inquiry. So let's go and do that now. So lowest price inquiry now implements price inquiry interface. So now I think we can actually run the test and make sure that everything is still working. So I've ended up in PHP unit tests, unit lowest price filter test, run that. And so we have one test, three assertions. I'm going to go back to the lowest price filter. There's a change which I want to make here. So we're no longer implementing promotions filter interface. It's going to be price filter interface. Again, I'm going to run the tests. One test, three assertions. Okay, great. Nothing has broken there. So we're on the right track. We can now go and start working on our price inquiry interface and making sure that it has the methods that we're expecting here. So first off, we'll do the ones relating to price. So we have a set price here. Quantity, that's sort of related to price because the only way we've used it is to multiply it by price to get total price. And then we have this set discounted price here. So over in price inquiry interface, create public function, set price. So that will take an integer and a price. Okay, now let's move on to the next one, which was set discounted price. Okay, and then the next one we were looking at was get quantity. And so this can be null or it can be an integer. And the tests are still passing for that. So let's go back to the lowest price filter. And the ones at which I didn't add were get product, set promotion ID and set promotion name. So thinking of our interface segregation here, we won't want all this stuff relating to price on the promotion inquiry interface. If we go and look at that one, you probably wouldn't want uh, methods relating to price and quantity on this. However, the stuff which is actually related to promotions and promotion uh, ID and also product, because of product uh, promotions all relate to a product, then I think those methods can actually go on the promotion inquiry interface. So I'll say get product. And this can return null or a product object. And then it was set promotion ID, which will be an integer, and set promotion name, which will be a string. Okay, we've made a few changes there. Let's go and run the tests. Still got one test, three assertions. And so if you look at the work that we've done there in splitting our interfaces, it fits nicely into the interface segregation principle, which says that clients should not depend upon interfaces which they do not use. Because if we created just one big interface, but uh, our filter was one which had um, no dealings with price and didn't need to know anything about prices, then it would have been there would have been quite a lot of redundancy in there because we would have had methods which the inquiry object would need to implement but would not actually use. 
The goal of interface segregation is to reduce the side effects and the frequency of changes required by splitting your software down into multiple parts. And that's something which we've just done there. It makes our software a lot more flexible and it means that should we make changes in the future, it should be a lot easier than if we just created one large interface. So you may have looked at that workflow there and thought it's a little bit back to front because in most cases what you would do is you would create the interface and then write the classes which actually implement that interface. But sometimes if I'm working on something from scratch, brand new application, what I'll do is I'll start with a very generic interface and just see where things go. And as you saw there, we've ended up at something which is abstract and reusable yet which fits our case quite nicely. In this one, we're going to have a think about how we can speed up the performance of our application by adding some caching. So I'm in the products controller, and if you look at our query here where we get the promotions, at the moment for what we've created, we've only actually put three in there, but they could actually come back with like 100 or something like that. And so for that reason, you might want to consider caching uh, that data so that the data is in memory say for example if you have a popular product uh, lots of people are making requests for it then instead of having to hit the database every time you can just uh, make the request it'll reach into memory grab the promotion straight from memory and it should speed up the process a whole lot more so let's go ahead first of all by grabbing cache from composer so all we need to do this is a uh, symphony cache by the way is composer require cache okay and so now if we go to our composer json we should see a new entry in there for cache so here we go on this line here line 16 on my composer json symphony cache Okay, so let's go and start putting this to use. So what I'm going to do is here, I'm going to say cache interface. The way that this will work is that we'll create a cache key. And first off, uh, the code will look in the cache for that key. And if it finds it, it will return the item for that key. If it cannot find that key in the cache, then what it will do, it will then go ahead and query the database and return the promotions but at the same time set the promotions as the item for the key which we were trying to obtain so uh, a demonstration will probably help you understand that better so what we're going to do here is say promotions equals and then we're going to say cash get and so we're looking to get a specific key you can name this key whatever you like but give it a name which is meaningful to you. So what we're going to say is find valid for product. So we'll stick with the same name here and then append an ID onto the end of that. So find valid for product and then this is going to be the ID of the product. We'll put another hyphen in between there. Okay, so like I say, first it looks in the cache for a specific key. If it is found, it will return the item for that key. If not, what we want to do is call a function or call a callback. And so here I'm saying item interface and that will represent an item in the cache. And it's at this point here. So we're, if we're hitting this callback function, it means we have what is called a cache miss. If we actually found the key in the cache, you have a cache hit but here we have a cache miss and so this is where we want to actually perform our logic and go and actually grab the data from the database instead so as you can see inside of our callback we're missing a couple of pieces here which is product and lowest price inquiry so i'm going to drop these in here the way we can get them into our callback function is we say use and then in parentheses just pass each one so product and then it's going to be lowest price inquiry. I'll drop this onto its own line because we're running out of space. And then here, instead of promotions equals, what we want to do is actually return this. So this is where it's making the query to the database, and then it's gonna return this. And at the same time, it will actually set it as the item on this key in the cache. 
let's have some feedback so that we know whether this is working or not. So like I say, the first time that we run this, the item won't be in the cache because we've not actually cached it yet. So we should hit the callback function because it is a cache miss. And so for that reason, what we'll do is we'll say var dump miss. And so we should see this. The second time when we run it, because after the first time, that item then gets placed in the cache under this key. And so the second time, the callback should not be called. So let's go and run this for the first time in Postman. I'll hit send. Okay, so we've got our results back here. And as you can see at the very top, this is what we var dumped. And so we're getting miss because it's the first time that we've been run. However, it, that callback will now have been called and we should have saved the data into the cache or save the item to the cache. So when I press send now, I no longer get miss because the callback is no longer being called and so this var dump will not be hit. That's working nicely, but if we go back to our controller here, uh, we know we're gonna get rid of this anyway eventually, so I'm not too worried about that, but if we look at the rest of it, it's becoming what is known as a fat controller. There's a lot of information in here. Does all this uh, information regarding caching need to be here or can it be abstracted away so that we can do it with just a smaller amount? Let's consider our options there. So one thing we might think of, it would be to maybe drop it into this valid for product on the repository. Don't recommend that you do that, but let's have a look at what that would look like and what the con think about what the consequences might be. So uh, I'm just gonna quickly throw some code in here, which I'll remove. So uh, we're saying we'll have a cache there. And so we'll need a private cache property, if I can spell it right. And then we'd set the property here. So this cache equals cache. And then we might think in our for, uh, find valid for product, we might first decide that we want to look in the cache. And then if we don't find it, we could then return the result of this query. However, there's a few reasons why this would not be a very good solution. For a start, repositories, they're really for just dealing with your database. And so we're getting a bit of a responsibility creep here, aren't we? Because we're looking in the cache first and then we're looking in the database, which I don't like. And also consider if we're testing this, if we decide we're gonna set up a test database, so maybe just a test MySQL or some in-memory database, would also then when we hit this method would also probably need to have some kind of test caching set up and it's already becoming quite a messy solution. So I wouldn't mix that. I'd keep your repository as it is uh, and just hit your SQL database using this. So what I'm gonna do is delete all of this stuff because not only that, it was also a little bit inside out, wasn't it? Because the first thing we want to do is look in the cache and if we don't find it in the cache, then look in the database, whereas here we're hitting a database repository method and then looking in the cache and then looking in the database. The whole flow just wasn't very good. I like to try my best not to turn my code inside out or have messy logic paths like that. If you think about the flow of this, what we want to do is look in the cache. If it isn't in the cache, then look in the database. And so what I think will be a nice little solution here will be to have a custom cache, so a promotions cache, which has its own find valid for product method, which does what we want it to do. It'll look in the cache. If it doesn't find it there, it'll just get it from the database. And so I'd like to reduce this down to a single line, which looks something like this. So we'll call it promotion cache, and then we'll call a method called find valid for product off of that cache which means that I should be able to get rid of all of this stuff here and that will give me what I need. So let's go ahead and build that now. Inside of source, I'm gonna create a directory which I shall call cache. And then inside of there, I'll create a class called promotion cache.
let's think about what this will look like and what we will need. So I'm going to create a constructor. We know we're going to need to look in the application cache. So that was cache interface. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use promoted properties here because I'm on uh, PHP 8.1 so I can do that. And so there I'm actually um, injecting that and also setting a property called cache at the same time. And we're also going to need our promotion repository. So I'm going to do the same thing there. And then we need a public function. find valid for product and then we'll think about our arguments in a second but I just want to drop in this code which we had in our controller and that should guide us on what we're going to need. Okay let's just work through it piece by piece. So here where we have our key and I see that we also have the product so we're going to need a product and then it says here that I need a lowest price inquiry, but if we look at this, all we're doing is getting a request date off of that. So let's just pass in a request date. So that will be string request date, and then I'll work through this. So we're going to be quite explicit here. We'll say key equals sprint f. So product get ID. So what happens there is the product ID or this percent D will be replaced by the product ID. And then I can just pass the key in there for cash. It's going to be this cash. So use product and request date instead of entity manager get repository. I mean, here we can say this repository find valid for product and then here where we actually create a date from our request date string we can say request date I'll just remove these comments here and here we're actually just going to return this cache get key so again it's working exactly the same hopefully you were able to follow that refactoring there we're going to look in the cache for this key if it's found, great, return the item, the cache item. Otherwise, call this callback, which is in turn going to hit the promotion repository and get us the data that we need. I'm going to leave this var dump in here for the time being so that we can still demonstrate uh, that it's working like it was before. Let's go back to Postman and ping this just to make sure everything is working. Okay, so we've definitely missed a big step there because our controller has absolutely no knowledge about this so we need to go back to our products controller and here instead of cache interface we're going to change this to promotion cache which is the same name that we gave it here if you remember our arguments so we need the product and then we need the lowest price inquiry get request date Okay, back over to Postman to try again. Great stuff, so we're getting our data back. There's actually a way that we can clear an item out of the cache, and so that way uh, it means that when we run it again, then we should see a cache miss. And so that is Symphony Console Cache colon pool colon delete. And then the name of the cache pool, we'll talk more about cache pools in the next one, because I think this one's overrunning. And then if you remember the name of our key, we said valid for product. So this is the name of the key. Obviously, that is the key ID. So if I run this, then we should see an item deleted from the cache. Okay, so I meant to call this valid for product. Uh, but what we'll do is we'll actually change the name there. And so we'll delete that and then we'll rename it, I think. So find valid for product. So as you can see, that item has been successfully deleted. Okay, I'm gonna change the name of that. So I want it to be called valid for product, not find valid for product. And so if we go and run this now, we should see a miss. Okay, so we get the miss. If we run it again, hit send, 
and just like so. I'll finish off by just tidying this up a bit so I'll remove that far dump there. We'll do our return type declaration so this can be null or an array. A quick look at our controller, we know we're going to remove this when we actually do our error handling and the rest of it is still quite lean, it's just a handful of lines. Uh, reads quite logically, we deserialize, we find the product, uh, we then set the product onto the inquiry, we find the valid promotions for the product, we try and retrieve them from the cache and we've abstracted all the detail away there and reduced it down to one line in our controller, nice and clean. And then we apply the promotions, reserialize, and send it back to the end user. By default, Symfony uses something called file caching, which is pretty good and it's a nice default to get you up and running, but it is the slowest type of caching. So in the next one, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set up Redis using Docker. Uh, so I'll show you how you can do that and how you can set that up. And I'll also show you stuff that you can do with this item here if you want to set an expiry on your cache. As stated previously, at the moment we're using the default uh, caching mechanism which is file cache, which is good for development and just getting things going. However, when you want to start uh, pushing your application to production, you might want something a little bit more performant. And so in this one, we're actually going to swap what we're using to use Redis cache. Before we do that though, there's something else which I'm just going to show you. At the moment, when we're storing items in the cache pool, they stay there indefinitely, and they only get removed if we perform some kind of manual intervention to remove them. However, that will start taking up space and taking up memory. What will be a better solution will be to set an expiry on them, just something sensible which uh, meets the requirements of your application, some kind of time limit after which time they actually get removed from the cache, and they only go back into the cache when that um, item when that key gets requested again and so there's a very easy way that you can do this in our promotion cache find valid for product method we just need to come to this bit here where we're saying return cache get and you'll see we have this item uh, that we've not actually used that used yet this is a cache pool item and on this inside of this callback we can actually set an expiry so what I'm going to do here is just set it to something sensible. So what would be a good idea? It all depends on your application, how long you set it for. Something like an hour for something like this might be a, a decent default. Uh, and so I'll probably leave it at that, but before I leave it at that, I'm just gonna set it to something really low just to demonstrate this in action. So if I set this to five seconds, you'll see that after five seconds, um, it expires and it gets removed from the cache. So we need something which will demonstrate that us, demonstrate that to us. So I'll put a var dump in here, miss. And so the first time we hit it, we should get a miss. And then the second time round, we should uh, not see that, depending on how fast we do this, of course. The first thing I'm gonna do is make sure that that is definitely not in the cache. So I'm gonna delete it manually. Symphony console cache colon pool colon delete cache app so that's the name of the pool that we are using and then the key is valid for product hit go okay and so it says the cache item valid for product one was successfully deleted just ignore this deprecation for now let's go over to postman and fire this off okay so first time we get a miss so i'll quickly fire it again and now let's count to five one two three four five run it again and as you can see, it's expired, and so we're hitting that callback again. So like I say, let's go back and set it to something a bit more sensible. So we'll say an hour for this, all depends on your application and what you think will be a sensible default. This value here is in seconds. What I'd like to do now is set up uh, Redis cache. So first thing I'm gonna do, because we're gonna be using Docker, is I'm just gonna run Docker Compose down. And then I'm going to go and make an adjustment to my docker-compose.yaml file. So here I'm gonna add a service called Redis and the image will be Redis 7.0.0 and then ports 6379 is standard for Redis. The next thing I'm gonna do is go over 
to my config and so in config packages cache here I can uh, update this file in order for it to use Redis and so here is the entry for Redis I just need to uncomment these lines here and so uh, the default storage is cache app and so now we're setting that to Redis what I need to do is change the address for the provider so double quotes percent percent and we're going to read an environment variable and this is going to work in pretty much the same way as what we did for our database let's go and give ourselves a reminder and so here uh, the URL for our database we said we're going to uh, resolve an environment variable and we use this naming convention here which was the name of the service for by underscore URL so that's exactly what we're going to do for Redis also so I might as well actually just go and copy this And all I'm going to change is this to Redis. So Redis is the name of our service underscore URL. Before I run Docker Compose up again to make this work, there's one package which we need to pull in from Composer, and that is Predis. And this is just a library for uh, helping PHP work with Redis. So Composer, require, and it is Predis. So P, Redis. And then same again, so nice and easy to remember. Hit go. That's now installed, so the final step will be to run Docker Compose up. And we should now be using Redis, so let's go back to Postman and test this out. So I'll fire this off. Okay, that seems to be working. We'll actually go back to PHP Storm and we shall empty that item from the cache and we'll put our var dump in here again miss let's go back to postman send the request okay so we get a miss fire it again we'll wait five seconds five four three two one fire it once more in fact I didn't actually set this to five seconds silly me okay so let's go and empty that from there again Okay, so we should see a miss. We'll fire this. Now it's in the cache. We'll wait for five, five, four, three, two, one. Fire it again. Miss. Okay, that's all working well. We now have Redis uh, working as our caching mechanism, and we've also set an expiry so the items don't stay in there lingering in the cache for any longer than what they need to. I'd now like to add some validation to make sure that our application is using or receiving the correct data and is able to work with the correct data in the correct formats. And so if we go to our products controller, the point of impact for that kind of thing would be here where we are deserializing into our data transfer object into our uh, inquiry class. However, again, I want to keep this controller fairly light, so I don't want to be throwing a load of validation and checking for errors in here. And also I'm thinking about creating a system which is quite scalable. And so when we perform this deserialization, okay, at this point in time, we just want to validate and make sure that it's receiving the correct kind of data. But there might be a point in future where you actually want more things to happen when you deserialize. You might want to check other things or fire off uh, different parts, different pieces of code to do different things. And so for that reason, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a little event listener system so that when uh, we do this deserializing here, okay, in our case, we're going to have some kind of listening uh, object which will perform the validation, but it means that in future, if we do want to do other things apart from uh, validation when we deserialize, then we'll have a system which can handle doing those other things. So this should scale really nicely, and it also means we'll be abstracting the detail away from our controller. So, where should this happen? Well, we created our custom serializer. Let's go and have a look at that. We called it DTO serializer, and we have this deserialize method here. Let's create a little bit more room. And so at the moment it's doing one thing, it's just returning the deserialized object. But what I'd like to do is add a hook in here, which fires after this deserialization has taken place. And then we can hook into that, 
and have our listener object which can perform the validation or have other listener objects which can do other things as well. So what we shall do is we shall store this object in a variable called DTO and then after that deserialization what we want to do here is fire off the event and then elsewhere in our application we will have objects which, which are listening for that event they will perform the tasks that they need to do all we're going to do from this uh, deserialized method here is just return that DTO now in Symfony there are two ways of listening to events or the two different types of objects which can listen to events there are event listeners which is probably the most loosely coupled system so you create an event and you can have a bunch of listeners but then you need to add some configuration which tells the listeners to listen to particular events. Otherwise than listeners, you also have event subscribers. So this is a bit more of a tightly coupled system because you're actually, uh, you actually tell the event subscribers which events they are listening to. You actually code it into the event subscriber class. But that is a system that we're going to go with. I think it's going to be fine for our needs and it means there's one less step we won't have to go through and actually add the configuration. So let's make a start. What I'm going to do is create an event folder inside of source. And inside there we'll create a class and we'll call this after DTO created event and this will extend event and so that is symphony contracts event dispatcher event and I'm going to create a constant to have a name which we can use because when you uh, get the event dispatcher to dispatch events you have to tell the event dispatcher uh, the name of the event you have to give the event a name so public const name equals and the typical format or the uh, the standard format that you use for this will be what is it followed by what is it doing and so here it is going to be our DTO and it will be created so we're explaining what it is and basically what has happened you don't have to stick with that but I'd recommend that you sort of stay with conventions because it just means that other developers uh, can read your code and sort of understand it and if we're all on the same page it just makes life easier for everyone. Okay so now I'd like my event and my event listeners or my event subscriber to be able to access that DTO so let's create a constructor and if you remember our most highest level uh, DTO was this promotion inquiry interface so we'll just pass that interface and because I'm using PHP 8 or I'm using PHP 8.1 as it happens uh, I can use promoted properties and so here I'm actually um, defining the property and setting it at the same time and then I just want a getter to be able to get this so fairly straightforward public function get DTO that will return a promotion inquiry interface return this DTO now we need to create our event subscriber which will subscribe to this event very important uh, how you name the folder that we put this subscriber in so you must call it event subscriber so inside of source event subscriber and then inside of there we'll create a class called DTO subscriber and this needs to implement event subscriber interface and that comes from symphony component event dispatcher and so I get the red squiggly lines if I hit alt and enter on a Mac then I can add my method stubs and so here it's telling me to add a method called get subscribed events. If you're not using PHP Storm, you don't have that available to you, then just create this public static function called get subscribed events. And here is where you actually create an array and return an array which lists all the events which this subscriber is subscribed to. And so return and we want the name of the event as the key and then as the value we want the actual 
uh, a method which we create in this class which will perform the logic for that particular event. And so our event name is after DTO created event and we can use our constant, our name constant, which we added to that class. And then the method, let's just have one called validate DTO. And so I'll go and create that now. In here, we can automatically inject our event and we're not going to return anything from here. What we're going to do is we're just going to perform our validation here. And if we get validation errors, I want to throw an exception. Something which I'll quickly explain, but I'll not demonstrate yet, is that whilst we're doing uh, just the one method here for validation, you can create multiple methods here. So you can create an array of methods, uh, which you create in this class, which will all uh, react and respond and perform certain functionality when they hear this event. So when we come and run the test, I'll quickly show that to you. Well, let's get back to the task in hand, and that is to validate the DTO. How are we going to do that? We're going to need the Symphony Validator component, which I don't think we have yet. So what I'm going to do is Composer require that. So Composer require Validator. Okay, Composer has gone and got that for me, which means that I can create a constructor and inject that. So validator interface which comes from symphony component of validator validator and we can do it all in one step by saying uh, private validator and then the first thing i need to do is get my dto so dto equals event and if you remember on our event we added that getter method get dto and then the way validator works is i can say arrows equals Validator, validate, and then you pass in the object which you are validating, which is our DTO. And then what we want to do is check, do we have any errors? And if we do, I want to throw an exception. So if count errors is greater than zero, then we will throw a new and I'd like some kind of exception here. If I start typing validation, which is sometimes quite a good strategy, you will see something which might appear about using Symphony, which might be of use to you. And so we've got one here called validation failed exception. Let's go and check out where we are importing that from. And so that comes from Symphony component validator exception validation failed exception. So that sounds like it should uh, fit the bill for us. So let's give that a go rather than go and create something ourselves. We'll go and check out its constructor. And so uh, we have one for value and the other one you'll see is this constraint violation list interface. If we go and look at that, you'll see that this extends traversable, countable and array access interfaces. And that is actually our errors. So our errors will be an instance of constraint violation list. So here uh, for the value property, we'll just say validation failed. We're not actually going to use that for anything, but the important part here is the errors. That's our event and that's our subscriber setup. So how are we going to actually check that this works? Ideally, I want to be able to check this in isolation before I go and hook it up to the uh, full service. So what I'm going to do is create a unit test and uh, I should be able to check in isolation quite nicely. So down in tests, unit, I'm just going to create a test called DTO subscriber test. And this will extend our service test case. And so we'll have a test called a DTO is validated after it is created or a DTO is validated after it has been created. So given what is our setup, we're going to need a DTO. Let's use our lowest price inquiry. I'm just going to keep life simple and check one piece of validation. In real life, I sort of have tests to validate everything, but here we just want to really make sure that our system is working. So I'm going to say DTO, and we have 
uh, the set quantity. So if you remember, we're going to need the quantity pretty much for, or in fact, for every single um, scenario. And so this is a pretty good one to test. And what I'm going to test here is that you can't set the quantity to a negative number. Then we're going to need our event. So event equals new after DTO created event. That takes the DTO as the argument. And then we're going to need to dispatch this event. In order to do that, we're going to need Symfony's event dispatcher. Very important that we get the event dispatcher from the container and we don't just new up an event dispatcher because if we did that, it means that there would be no connection made between this event and the actual subscribers. And so the way that we can get the event dispatcher from the container, I'll show you a way of actually checking the auto wiring. So I can say Symfony console debug colon auto wiring and then if I just type event dispatcher you need to have a pretty good idea of what the class names are called or maybe what the the service name is and so in this case I know that there is an event dispatcher class or event dispatcher interface if I hit enter this is what I get back and so here are the auto wireable types for event dispatcher and the part that you see in blue here is the actual name which is used by the container to refer to the event dispatcher and if you see this here the event dispatcher interface is a central point of Symfony's event listener system so uh, important there is the central point so that is what is making the connection between events and listeners and events and subscribers and so we'll grab the container service name here I'll copy that you'll see this deprecation notice at the bottom here sometimes these are quite useful uh, so this one is saying user deprecated method symphony component event dispatcher event subscriber interface get subscribed events might add array as a native return type declaration in future do the same in implementation DTO subscriber now to avoid errors blah 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 and so what he's telling me is that in the future a uh, return type declaration of array might be added for get subscribed events so it's advising me uh, to do that here so we'll do that and then we'll go back to the test sorry for the little detour there and we need an event dispatcher which I can get from the container like this this container get and then the ID so the name of that event dispatcher and I'm just going to add a dot block here to get some uh, auto completion so event dispatcher interface and then I can add the when part of the test so when I'm say event dispatcher dispatch and if we go and look at this method uh, we just need to pass the event object. Okay, so that's actually incorrect there because what happened was when I uh, added an event dispatcher interface to this dot block here, I pulled in the wrong one. So it's not the PSR event dispatcher event dispatcher interface. What you actually want is the one from Symfony. So it's uh, event dispatcher interface, which is Symfony contracts event dispatcher. And so with the correct one pulled in here, if we go and look at this, you need to pass the event as the first argument and the event name as the second argument. And so you'll see me fix that code uh, in a minute. And what we're going to do here is put an expectation in, an expectation that a validation failed exception will be thrown when this event is dispatched because it will hit our uh, validate DTO method here in the subscriber and it should fail validation because we are setting a negative quantity so we haven't actually set up that validation yet but that is going to be our flow of events and so here we can say expect and the way we can check for expected validation errors is say this expect exception and then the name of the exception, which is validation failed, exception, colon, colon, class. And you can also check for ex exception messages, which we'll also do, but we need to figure out what that message is going to be first. 
Let's go over to our Laws Price Enquiry and this is where we're going to set up our validation. We can actually do it on each property by adding asserts or adding constraints. Let me show you how, I, how we do that. So we're going to use constraints. So this is Symphony Component Validator Constraint as assert and it is going to be constraints that we use. Let me show you some of those constraints now. So, we looked at quantity, that's what we're testing in this one. So the way that you do this is, what I'd like to say is that I don't want uh, a blank quantity to be sent. And for our test, we don't want negative numbers and there's one actually called positive, which makes sure that the value is positive. Behind the scenes I'm just going to put in some extra uh, constraints for some of the other properties. And so this is what I've come up with, just a bit of validation added to some of the properties which will be set mainly during deserialization. And the ones which will get set by the modifiers, I've just left them alone just to keep life simple for this exercise. Okay, and so when validate is called, our validate method, which we have in the validate DTL method in our subscriber, then all of those constraints will be checked. And if any of them fail, then it will be added to the constraint violation list, i.e. our errors uh, array, which we are creating here. And like I said, as well as uh, ex checking which exceptions to expect, you can also check the message. So if we go back to our lowest price inquiry and we just click on this positive constraint here, it says that the message is this value should be positive. And so that will be our exception message or that will make up part of our exception message if this particular constraint fails. So let's copy that and in our test, we'll also check the message with expect exception message. And with that, I think we're okay to go and run our test. So. Fando bin PHP unit test unit DTO subscriber test dot PHP. Okay, and so we have a failure. And the reason for that failure actually is that I've done this wrong. So here we when we dispatch, we need to dispatch the event, but we also need to provide it the name of the event. So event and then I can call that constant directly off my event object there. If I go and run this again, hopefully this is going to uh, pass. Okay, so we get one test, two assertions. Uh, just a couple of things to point out. This message here, we don't actually, it doesn't need to match exactly. For example, it just needs to match um, a part of the message. So if I removed some of this and just had a couple of words, this should still pass. Okay, so this just needs to be found inside of the full message. If you haven't already checked out my testing PHP course, then I'll leave a link in the description, but I go through loads of stuff like this, uh, handling exceptions in tests and pretty much anything you want to do with PHP tests in the course. So like I say, I'll leave a link in the description. Uh, but for now, if you remember what I said when we created our DTL subscriber, and I said you can have other methods which are actually listening for this event. So let's go and give that a try now. So what you need to do is create a array inside of this array. And then there for each one, because uh, there is going to be more than one, if you leave it as default, if I just added another method, then they will be called in um, subsequent order. But then you can also give them points and the one with the highest points will get called before others. It's a priority. So if I gave this a priority of 100, shall we say, so we need to then put this in an array itself. If we give this a priority of 100, and then we create another method, I'll just call it do something else. And if we give that a priority of one, then it will be the validate DTO method which gets called first. We'll go and add that do something else method. And in here we'll just dump out doing something else. Now at the moment because of the way that this is working, because a validation uh, exception is thrown here, we won't actually even hit this method, but we'll go and run it anyway. 
Okay, so as you can see, the tests run as per uh, usual, and we're not actually hitting this method. But if we change the priorities of these and we make this 100 and then we make this one, it means that this one will be called first. And so we should dump out uh, this here. So let's go and run this. Okay, cool. And so that's what happens. Uh, yeah, and so basically what I'm just saying there is uh, when this event is fired, you can have multiple methods on this subscriber which will react and respond to that event. But I'm going to put this back the way that it was because we only need our validation. But I was just showing you how this works and how uh, you can actually perform more than one action when you listen to particular events. We'll go back and run the tests again. So we're finishing on a green test and we'll run all the tests again. So I'd recommend you do that if you've been working on a particular test and just uh, running one test in isolation. Make sure you haven't break, broken anything else. And so there we just run all the tests, everything is working. And now all that remains is to plug this into our DTO serializer and then take it for a test drive. So I shall create a event dispatcher property. So private. And this will be event dispatcher interface. Again, make sure you get the right one. So this comes from Symphony Contracts Event Dispatcher. And we'll call that event dispatcher also. Inject that through our constructor. So event dispatcher and then just set the property. So this event dispatcher equals event dispatcher. Down to our deserialize method. So here there's two things we need to do. We need to create the event and we need to dispatch the event. So first off, event equals new. After DTO created event, then we pass in our DTO. And then we simply dispatch it. So just underneath this comment, this event dispatcher dispatch first argument is the actual event the second argument is the actual event name so just following the steps in this deserialize method here we deserialize into the dto we create the event passing in the dto as a single constructor argument and then we dispatch the event and we know that we'll have our event subscriber listening for that so next we need to go over to postman and we're just going to fire off our request. So here I'm expecting validation to pass because all of these look good. So we'll send off that. Okay, and so we get a status 200. Everything's set, everything's working. Let's make our validation fail. So here I'm going to set quantity to negative five. Send this off. Big explosion, which is good. So this doesn't look very nice. It's all quite ugly. Uh, but it's doing what we want it to do because if you see what the actual problem is it says that this value should be positive So our validation is working It's saying symphony component validator exception validation failed exception So even though this doesn't look great, it's perfect. It's doing exactly what we need it to do But we're going to make this a lot more graceful and so error handling is something that we're going to work on next we're now going to start having a look at creating some uniform error handling in our service and also some uniform types of responses for when things go wrong. So currently in dev mode, this is what we see uh, when we uh, initiate a validation exception, but we'll see something similar for any other kind of exception. Let's switch over and we'll go to our .env file and we'll change to prod mode. So. Uh, app env is dev, so that says that we're in development mode, so it will show us some exceptions and show us kind of what is going wrong. In prod mode, this is what we would see, so a lot less information. Uh, it's just telling us we have an internal server error and the status is 500. Well, in reality, we don't actually have an internal server error. This error has been triggered by the user by passing the wrong kind of information. And in that scenario, we don't want to be sending back a 500 status. We want to be sending back an error or an, uh, an error response, which begins with a four. And also we want the detail to be different. We want to be able to tell the user, not that it is an internal server error, but it is actually something which they've done wrong and want to be able to sort of give them a hint as to what they have done wrong. 
And so really in order to achieve that, there's two things that we're looking at really. We want to have more control over the exception and we want to have more control over the response and the response format. When you're using Symfony, you can actually listen in your application for exceptions being thrown and create listeners which will handle those exceptions uh, in a way which suits your application. And so there's actually a very good example on the documentation which we'll take inspiration from. But uh, before we go into that, I'll just show you this paragraph here. During the execution of a Symfony application, lots of notica notifications are triggered. Your application can listen to these notifications and respond to them by executing any piece of code and so that's what we're going to do. So we've already dispatched our own custom event but here we're going to listen to one which is being triggered actually when an exception is thrown. And so here is that example here. We're going to create an exception listener which is going to listen to exceptions being thrown and then we're going to throw in some of our own handling uh, which will look fairly similar to this but will actually um, be more customized to our own application. And so what we need to do is go over and we're going to create an event listeners folder. And so in our SRC folder, we're going to create another one. And this will just be event listener. And then in there, I'm going to create a class called exception listener. And I'm going to create a method called on kernel exception and this is going to be listening explicitly for an exception event and all the handling will take place in this method and it's not going to return anything on the exception event I can actually grab the exception by saying event get throwable so I'll store that in a variable called exception and then what we're going to do is just dump that out. So at the moment, that won't work because unlike our event subscriber, we need to actually go and wire this up in our config, in our services YAML file. So over in config, services, and we're going to add another service at the bottom here. So we've not actually added any of our own custom services at this point. So this is going to be the first one that we add. And this will be in app, event listener, and it's called exception listener. And then we need to add a tag. So tags are a way of providing some extra information about your service in order for it to be able to function correctly. So in this case, we need to say that this is going to be a uh, kernel exception listener. And we also need to say that it's going to be listening to a specific event. And so name will be kernel event listener and the event will be kernel dot exception so again we're saying this is a kernel event listener and it is listening for kernel exceptions one other thing to note here is the name that we use so this name we didn't just make it up randomly this is actually a naming convention so you use the word on followed by then like Pascal case kernel exception to match the actual event. Other ways of doing this will be to here just say uh, method. You can also do that and then pass the name of the method. But we're going to stick with the way that we're doing it. And so now when an exception is thrown in our application, we should hit this method here. And so we should now be able to see this uh, when we dump it out. So. Uh, one thing I need to do is go and change this back to dev mode and then we can switch to postman and go and fire this off. As you can see, we're now getting our validation felt exception, which is exactly what we are dumping out on this line here. Now, like I said at the beginning, we want to be able to have more control over the exception. We also want to be able to have more control over the response and the format of the response and certainly the response status code. And so let's make a start on that stuff. Uh, I don't like using this validation fail exception because we've got no real control over it. It's something that someone else created. So let's actually go and create our own. So inside of source, I'm going to put it in this service folder here just for uh, lack of a better place to put it really. And I'm going to call it service exception. And then this is going to extend 
HTTP exception, which comes from Symfony Component HTTP Kernel Exception. And if we go and have a look at this, you'll see that it implements HTTP exception interface. If we go and look at that, as you can see, it's got a method here, get status code. So for our uh, HTTP exception, we can actually set a status code on this, which means that we'll then have that control over the status code, which is gonna be sent back in the response. And so if we go to our event subscriber, and it was our DTO subscriber, this is where we were throwing that exception. Let's now change this to our service exception. And the first argument for this is the actual status code. So we'll set that to 422. And the error message for now, we're just gonna stick with validation failed. But we're gonna put some more work into our error messages shortly. Back over in our exception listener, let's actually just go and fire off another request in Postman and make sure that we are now seeing our service exception, which indeed we are. And that means that we should be able to grab that status code off there. So dd get status code. And so now we're seeing 422. So we now have control over that status code, which is pretty good progress. What we want to do now is get control over the response. And so I'm gonna create a new response. And this will be a JSON response, which comes from Symfony Component HTTP Foundation. And so the first argument is the data. So let's have a think about this. What kind of format do we want to see this in? Now, obviously this is going to be different for the different types of exceptions which are thrown. But if we're just thinking about validation exceptions for the time being, and we'll just deal with that, what I'm gonna do is hard code something in, which sort of looks like the final format that I'd like to go with. So what I think would be pretty cool would be something like this. Here I am on the API platform uh, documentation and I'm looking at one of their uh, validation responses or validation failure responses. And so it has a type, a title, a description, and it also has a array of violations, which would be pretty cool. So I think I'm gonna follow a similar kind of format to this. Might not be permanent, but I think it'll be a start and something that we can uh, build upon as we go along. So like I say, I'm just gonna hard code this for now. I don't think you need to watch me type and figure it all out. So just behind the scenes, uh, I'm gonna work this out and we're gonna speed forward a bit. Okay, so this is what I've come up with, which should mirror uh, what the API platform does. So we have a type, we have a title, we have a description, and then an array of violations. So obviously they'll only be there for validation type exceptions. Next, we want to set the status code on the response. And so if you remember what we said, if we implementing the HTTP exception, it means that we have access, uh, we can set the actual status code on there itself. Otherwise, what we'll do is we'll just send back a 500. So what I want to do here is check if the exception is an instance of HTTP exception interface, in which case we will say response and I've actually spelt this wrong here. I was gonna say response. Okay. Set status code, and so this will be exception get status code. Else, we'll just simply set it to a 500. And so on uh, Symphony Component HTTP Foundation response, there's a bunch of constants which you can access. And what we're looking for is HTTP internal server error, which will mean a 500 response. And then finally, all I need to do is add this response to the event. So event, set response, response. And so when this uh, exception event is fired in our application, we're listening for it here. We set, we create the response, which is in this format, exactly how we want it. And then we set the response on that event. And that is what will get sent back. So we've totally 
uh, intercepted any exceptions in our application, handled it our own way and sent it back in the format that we want to. So let's go and give this a test drive. If I go back over to Postman now and send this. Okay, this is looking pretty good. As you can see here we have the 422 which is what we set on our service exception and we get the violations back in the format that we wanted type, title, description, and an array of violations. Everything's looking good. However, it is still hard coded. So what we're gonna start working on next is we're gonna start figuring out how to um, send back different formatted responses for different types of exceptions. Okay, so in this one, what we want to do is uh, get rid of this hard coding here. I want to come up with a way of uh, having some kind of data object which will handle exception data for me. So that's what we're going to work on. Before we get uh, started on that though, there's just one small change which I made behind the scenes just to keep the tests working really, because uh, I know some people are forking the repo and uh, some of the tests might not be working. I don't like that to be happening on the main branch. So we made the change um, to our event and event dispatcher uh, for our after DTO created event. And so uh, the subscriber in there, we changed it uh, to use the service exception now because originally we were going to use a validation built-in validation failed exception. So all I've done is in tests unit DTO subscriber test, I've just updated the test validate DTO method. Uh, so you can just copy that there. And also if I've created a new uh, test called test event subscription. So that's just testing that uh, the event is actually being subscribed to. And so that's it really. Uh, now we can move on and make a start. Like I say, what I'd like to have is have an object which is responsible for producing this data and it'll um, produce different data depending on the circumstances. So in our example here, this is a validation failure. So it will produce this particular data which has a list of validation uh, violations. But in other circumstances, you won't have that. And so it needs to be quite flexible and to be able to do different things. There is a particular design decision which I've made and that is to simplify this a little bit. So the example from the API platform documentation showed that it had a title key and a description key. But I thought we're giving ourselves a little bit too much work to do there. So I've kept it quite simple. We're just gonna have type uh, and that will cover all kinds of exceptions. And then in the case of validation exceptions, we'll have this list of violations. So in reality, you would want that extra bit of information, title and description, um, but it means we'll be putting in a lot of work for something which isn't really necessary. The purpose of this recording is really to show you how you can handle and bundle up the data which is needed to go back with uh, responses when an exception is thrown. So we don't have to cover the whole uh, A to Z, we can just cover a couple of keys here. Okay, talking out of the way, now we really are going to make a start. So we want some kind of data object which was, is going to handle uh, or is going to hold all the uh, information needed when we return an exception response. So inside of source, I'm going to put this in service. I'm going to create a new um, data class here, and I'll just call this service exception data. If you can think of a better name, then feel free to uh, add a comment or send me a PR. The way I'd like this to work is that I inject my service in in exception data into the constructor of the service exception and then that exception can retrieve the service exception data and then call a method on it which will produce uh, this array which we see here. So let's go over to our service exception and we'll create a constructor. Okay, so that might have scared you a bit there. We don't need all of this stuff. All we're gonna inject into our constructor is a service data exception or service exception data. And that is gonna hold a status code and a type. And we'll use that type for the message. So here I'm gonna say status code equals exception data get status code 
and for message, exception data, get type. And then I'm going to initialize a field or initialize a property called exception data. So let's go over to our service exception data. Sorry if this feels like we're going backwards and forwards a little bit, but I just want to get us to a point where we can actually uh, reproduce and send back this in as few steps as possible. So service exception data for the constructor here, uh, it's going to be a status code. Okay, so I'm going to make this protected so that a child can inherit these properties because what I'm going to do is have this as the default but if you want to go a bit more specific with the data that you're returning, for example, with the va uh, validation failures, then we'll have, still have access to these properties which I'm defining here. So protected integer status code protected string type. And then we'll create some getters and uh, getters only. So not getters and setters, just getters for each of those. I don't need the dot blocks here because we have self-documenting code. In order to be able to produce that array, we're just going to have a two array method here. This will return an array. And then... I'm just going to go and cut this from our exception listener and return it here. Okay, back in our exception listener. So what we're going to do here is we're going to have exception data equals exception get and we need a method for get exception data. So let's go back to our service exception. Okay, so I've been able to auto generate that. We're going to return the get exception data. Okay, so you might have seen a little problem with this at the moment because we're making an assumption that this is always going to be a service exception and it might not always be a service exception. So it's a little bit happy path at the minute just to get things working, but we are going to make uh, a change later on where we'll check to see if this is an exception. Uh, a service exception if it is we'll handle it in the way that we are if not we'll add a little bit of extra handling for other circumstances okay so exception data equals exception get exception data and then we're going to call that exception to or sorry exception data to array and so this isn't going to work yet we need to remember where we've actually thrown that service exception and that was in event subscriber. So here what we're going to do now is create a validation exception data variable. New service exception data status code will be 422 and the type will be constraint violation list. And so here all we do is inject the validation exception data into the constructor. So at the moment uh, we're just using our generic service exception data. Like I say, we are going to subclass this with something a little more specific uh, to the needs of validation exceptions. But this I think should work for now. We're creating our exception data, we're passing it into the service exception. We're now able to Access that exception data here and call the to array method on it. If we go and have a look at this, we've actually hard coded what is being returned, so we should see this. Like I say, we're going to actually remove title and description, and so this is what we should see. Let's go and give this a try in Postman. Okay, so it says we have an undefined method here, but we do have that method defined. Let's go and investigate a little bit more. And so the problem looks to be this. I'd actually forgot that I need to remove those. So when we're creating our parent construct in our service exception, we just need status code and message uh, because 
the other three uh, properties there, they have defaults, so we don't need to be passing anything. So let's go back and try Postman again. Okay, and so this time we get what we're looking for. It's returning our data in the format that we want it in. Obviously, this is hard coded at the moment, so we need to go and do some more work on this. And our next move is really to subclass our service exception data uh, with a class which handles validation errors. So in the service again, I'm going to create a new PHP class. I'll call this validation exception data. And so this will extend service exception data. And we'll need a constructor because here I want to pass in a, a constraint violation list, i.e. our violation, our validation errors. So status code type constraint violation list, and I'll just call this violations. I'm just going to remove these and set them on the parent instead. And I will initialize a field for violations. Okay, cool. First of all, let's just get this working as quickly as we can. So I'm going to go back to service exception data. I'm going to copy this. And I'm going to simplify it here for the parent. So this is just returning a type. And so with that done, what I'm going to do is just make sure this is working by going back to the DTO subscriber. I'm going to change this for validation exception data. And so here as our third argument, we pass our errors variable because that is a constraint violation list. And so I think with this, I can actually go back to Postman and just check that it's still working. Okay, everything is still good there. Now let's go and handle those violations and we'll do this step by step. So we'll create a method here and we need to actually um, loop over those violations and sort of format it in the way that we see here. And I'll show you what we have access to as we go along. So I'm going to create a method called getViolationsArray. And basically what I want that to do is to return this. And so for now, just to take things one step at a time, we'll go and cut that from there, drop it in there, and we'll just say violations is this, get violations array, which means that everything should still be working exactly the same. Let's run this. Okay, perfect. So now we need to figure out that logic. Let's start out by creating an empty violations array in which we can store everything. And then I'm going to loop over our violations. But just before I do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to dump them out just so that you can see them. And then we'll actually go back to Postman and run this. Okay, so let's have a look at what we've got here. So we have a, a constraint violation list, and then inside of there we have a violations array. And if you'll notice, we have a message, and we also have a property path on each of the violations, which is exactly what we are looking for here. And so how do we access those? So what we wanna do is add each of these records to our violations array. We'll cut that from there. And then I can actually just say violation get message. In fact, I want property path there. Get property path. And there's one called get message, as you've just seen. Violation get message. And that means that I can delete this here and just return my violations array. In fact, I'll need to spell this correctly. Okay, good. So this time I think we should see 
uh, two violations. Let's go and run this. Okay, great. So we didn't send a request date. So let's go and have a look at our body. So we sent an empty request date and we sent a negative quantity. And if we look here, we get two violations. Uh, one for quantity. This message, uh, sorry, this value should be positive. And we have one for request date. This value should not be blank. Okay, perfect. So now we have a custom system uh, of sending back the correct data for when we get validation exceptions. And so really to round off error handling, we need to uh, add to our exception listener here to handle other types of exceptions which haven't been thrown by us but have been thrown elsewhere in our application so they're not service exceptions because we're being a bit presumptuous here with our return and also we just need to go through our application and find places where there might be errors for example if we're trying to find a product here uh, using this ID we don't have any error handling for if a product could not be found. So little examples like that, we'll try and top and tail this off and that should complete our error handling. Now let's have a look at other places where exceptions can be thrown in our application and how we can deal with those. I've come back to the products controller because earlier in the course I left myself a little message here, add error handling for not found product. Okay, so the way I'm going to go about this is I'm going to create another method on our repository because I could start going down the route of saying if uh, product found here, do this, else do this. But I don't like making a big mess in my controllers. Uh, if I can sort of handle things in other ways and try and keep this as light as possible, then I will do. So I'm going to borrow a bit of inspiration uh, from Laravel. If you've ever used Laravel, there's a nice little uh, method in there on the models called find or fail, which throws an exception if the model cannot be found. So uh, that's a pretty cool way of handling things, I think. So we're going to do that. So let's go over to our uh, product repository. And just at the top here underneath the constructor, ignore all this other stuff which uh, Symfony does for you behind the scenes. We'll add a public function here and we'll call this find or fail. This will take an ID which will be an integer and it will return a product. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to carry on as normal and try and find a product using an ID. So we'll say product equals this find, so we're calling the find method on the repository, we'll pass the ID, and then what we're going to do is check to see if we have a product. In fact, we're going to check to see if we don't have a product. So if no product, then what we need to do is create a service exception data, new service exception data. We need a status code. So we'll look in here at a not found. So we'll say 404 and then the type. And so for the type, we'll just say product not found and that'll be descriptive enough, I think. Product not found. And so now we need to throw a service exception. Throw new service exception. The only thing we need to pass to that is our exception data. So you probably agree this is pretty clean, easy, and uh, with two lines that will handle it in just the way that we want it to and give us nice messaging, a nice exception, which is easy for the end user to understand. And then here, what we're doing is we're just gonna return product because uh, if we reach this stage, nothing has gone wrong. We have a product that we can return. Let's go back to our products controller and we're going to change this to find or fail. We can remove our messaging here. Let's go over to Postman. Back over in Postman, we don't want to be triggering uh, validation exceptions now, so we're going to try and avoid doing that. So we're going to have uh, good data here, and what we need to do is look for a product which doesn't exist. So let's go for product number 55, hit go. Okay, I like it. So we're getting a 404 not found, perfect. And our type is product not 
found. So now we know that we can handle other types of exceptions in our service. But how about if an exception is thrown which isn't a service exception? Because if you remember our listener, we don't actually have anything set up for that. And so we're making the assumption that we're going to have this get exception data on our exception. But if we throw something which isn't a service exception, we won't get that. I think a demo will help us out here. So we don't need this anymore. That was just for when we were setting up. We've now got uh, some decent error handling in there. Let's just go and uh, get rid of that. And I'm going to throw a different type of exception. So we'll just go with something random. JSON exception. Let's we'll say your JSON sucks. Okay, so this should be hit first now. Let's go back to Postman and run this. Kaboom. So we get a big explosion, internal server error. And what it's saying is we have an undefined uh, method error, and that is get exception data because this wasn't a service exception which was thrown, it was a JSON exception. So what is our remedy? What we need to do is we need to go back to our exception listener and we need to edit this to be able to handle other kinds of exceptions in case it's not a service exception which has been thrown. And so the way I'm going to start this off is to say, if exception is an instance of service exception, then we're going to say exception data equals exception get exception data. For this part, I'm actually going to set a status code variable. Okay, so we've set our status code to 500 there, and then I'm going to create an exception data equals new service exception data status code will be the status code and for the type we'll just say exception get message and then all i need to do is cut that from there and drop it underneath so let me explain what just happened so we're checking to see if it's if it's an, a service exception in which case everything is good. We can just use the exception data, which we get back from the exception data method. Otherwise, I'm gonna set the status code to 500 and I'm actually gonna physically create a service exception data. We pass in the status code and we'll just use the uh, message which we get off of the exception. And then I have exception data in either of those cases. So that means that I can call exception data to array and then we just send back the response as normal. So still only a few lines of code. And this time, if I go and run this in Postman, I'm expecting to see something a bit more sensible. Okay, so my service, uh, the status code is correct, 500. And then we have type your JSON sucks. So now we know that we are handling other types of exceptions than service exceptions here. And so I hope that you were able to follow that. Really only a couple of changes. We've added a new method to our product repository and we've uh, edited our exception listener so it can handle other types of exceptions in case they are thrown and it's not service exceptions which are thrown. Just going to go back to the product controller. I'm going to get rid of this line here which isn't needed. And again, I'll show you one other change which I made to the tests because I'm trying to keep these tests working. Uh, and that is DTO subscriber test. So uh, the line here, exception message is now constraint violation list. If I go and run the tests, so everything works. Uh, if you are seeing errors in any of your code, don't forget that I create a branch for uh, most, if not all of the lessons. The one for this one is called other exceptions and you can get the latest code if you just have a look at the main branch. If you have any comments, questions, or anything you want to ask or tell me, then just leave a comment in the comments below and I'll see you in the next one. We're now in a position, I think, where we can actually integrate this with another service or another application. Just going to do a couple of little bits of editing and tidy up before I do that. Uh, this responds here, so I'm going to comment that out for now. And then we're going to go back to returning our JSON response. So return new JSON response, if it finds it for me. New JSON response, which comes from Symfony. 
component HTTP foundation. And so our arguments are, first of all, we need the data, which is our response content. Next will be our status code. So response HTTP, OK. Next is headers, but I don't want to set any headers, but I do want to set this JSON bool flag to true, meaning that our response content is already in JSON format. So because I don't want to use the headers there, what I'm going to do is actually uh, make these named arguments. So the first one is data. The next one is status. And then this last one is JSON, which will set to true. So we'll just go back and have a look at this class here, the constructor. And so as you can see there, uh, bool JSON if the data is already a JSON string, which means I can get rid of that one. And then we'll just go over to Postman and run it again. So let's fire this off. Okay, and so we get our data back. Everything's still working okay. It's in JSON format. Perfect. Now let's go back to our service and in our product class we've got a load of stuff which I commented out here so I'll just uh, tidy some of this stuff up uh, by the way if you've seen other areas where you think things could be tidied up or I'm um, using getters and setters which I ain't using anything like that then uh, feel free to send me a pull request or just mention it to me and we can uh, sort it out together bit of teamwork I'll just check a couple of other files in my price modifier factory, I don't need a comment here to tell me what I'm doing. I'll usually use comments to explain why, may explain the decision why I've done something, but just to explain what's happening, you should be able to write code which is fairly self-explanatory. So I'll try and remove all kinds of comments like that. I left them in here maybe to help yourself uh, throughout the recordings, but we don't need them anymore. Uh, date range multiplier here when we were figuring out our maths and our logic, we don't need that there. Uh, event items multiplier, load of mess in here, just uh, get rid of it all, we don't need it, it's fairly self-explanatory what's going on. Uh, DTO serializer, there's one there, service exception looks okay, service exception data looks okay. Okay, I think we're good. One last step will be to run the tests, Fando bin PHP unit tests. Okay, seven tests, 10 assertions. One of them ran a little slow there, so I'll probably investigate that behind the scenes. For now, we can move over to a little service which I created, which will interact with this one. So let me talk you through this. I've created a little marketing um, front-end service. Uh, most of this is actually just dummy markup, which I got from Bootstrap. Uh, the dynamic parts are the product name, a bit of a product description there, and this part here. So this is what is being driven by what comes back from the promotions engine. Let's go and have a look at some code. I've created literally uh, three files and I've added one entry to a config file, which I'll show you. So we have a product entity. I've kept it very simple. It has an ID, it has a name, it has a description, and then the all important part for communicating with the promotions engine is, is the product ID, which we have here. And then it's just a bunch of getters and setters. Let's go over to the products controller. And so I basically kept all my logic in the controller because I just wanted to knock something together quickly here. Uh, let me talk you through what this does. So first of all, it takes some query parameters in order to get all the information it needs. Let's go back to browser and see what those are. And so um, those are quantity, uh, which I've set to five and request location, which is UK. And then the uh, the number there, that is the ID of the product in this front end services database, which is a different database to our promotions engine. I'll show you that shortly. Okay, so it grabs the query parameters because it's going to need those. And then it gets a product from a database using the ID. So the ID which you see there in our URL. Next, this whole block which you see here, this is the request which is being made to the promotions engine. And so I'm using Symfony's HTTP client to do this. We're making a post request. This is the URL. I'll explain where this part comes from in a second. But as you can see, it's going to products uh, using the product ID and then the lowest price endpoint. 
absolutely nothing new there. That's exactly what you see here. Products, product ID, lowest price endpoint. And then we set the body. And so you can do that using uh, this JSON key here. And so we're setting the quantity. If there isn't a quantity, we're actually setting it to one. So a little bit of safety sort of built into the design there. And then we have the rest of the stuff, request location, voucher code, request date, and the product ID, which is all the information which the promotions engine needs. And then we check to see if there is a successful response. And if there is, it will uh, change the promotion data, which it uh, gets back here. This is the um, response. And if there is, it will convert the response body to an array that gets stored in promotion data and then that can be accessed on our front end which I'll show you in a second and so there we're passing through the product which is the product which was queried from this front end services database and then the promotion data which has come back from the promotions engine and so we're rendering a front end file here show html dot twig okay so uh, this is a bit of a mess. There's quite a lot of stuff here. We've, I've just grabbed this from uh, a bootstrap template on get bootstrap. But all of this I will push up uh, to GitHub and I'll leave a link below the video so you can go and grab this because I'm sure you don't actually want to be um, doing all this yourself just to be able to demonstrate it. And so the two little bits at the top here, product name and product description, that is what you see here. And then... If we come a bit further down, I'm checking to see if there is a promotion. And so we check a little bit of logic. First off, we're checking here if we're getting a 200 response back. If so, all is good, we can send things back as they are. Otherwise, I'm actually setting the promotion to null. So you can probably think of a better way to do this and a better way to handle errors in general. Uh, what I would also do is put some logging in here, uh, if I was going to do it this way, just to let the owner of this service know that um, you're trying to get this promotion back from the promotions engine, but it doesn't actually have one for the request you're making. I'd maybe log some info like that to a log. Uh, but like I say, so if things haven't gone well, there isn't a promotion, just we return a product for the product key and null for the promotion. And so that's what we're checking for here. If there is a promotion, all's good, we can display it. And so... Uh, I think there was just one little piece of information which I displayed about it, which was the discounted price. And that is what you are seeing right there. Okay, and so if a promotion isn't found, what happens is that this panel will not be displayed at all. So let's actually demonstrate that first. I'll go and put in uh, product number two. Now there is a product number two in my database. However, let me quickly show you my database. Uh, that is this one here, Acme Radio Knobs, but it's a product ID of 66. The important thing here is that that number 66 is what gets sent to the promotions engine. And I know that in my promotions engine database, there isn't a, uh, a reference for a product with an ID of 66. And so in that case, we should get uh, an error um, response sent back from the promotions engine. And so let's go and try this. Okay, so we got an error response, and that means that we don't actually show a promotion because we don't have a promotion to show. Okay, a little discussion around this approach. This was just knocked up just to show you some integration between two different services, a front-end service and a back-end service. Um, so in real life, would I design it like this? No, probably not. I'd probably do something more asynchronous so that it's going to load the page and then maybe make the call behind the scenes to the promotions engine and just um, populate the data once it comes back after doing that call. Otherwise, your users might end up hanging there waiting for that response to go to promotions engine. There is one other thing which I said that I would show you. If we go to our product controller, so this bit here, this promotions engine URL, which is a property on our controller, I've set this in the constructor, but you're probably looking at this thinking, well, where does the actual value come from for this? Let me show you that. So if we go to config, so this is in uh, config, and then services.yaml, if we have a look here. So underneath the keys, services, default bind, I then uh, binded a variable. So if you do this, it means that 
you'll be able to inject a variable called promotions engine URL through your constructors and also in your methods, I think, in uh, controllers. And then that is set to this value here, which I set just above where I define my services underneath parameters. So promotions engine URL, and then I've just set it to uh, the promotions engine URL, which was given when I set up a development server. And so I have my promotions engine running on just a development server at this address. And then for this promotions client uh, service thing that you're looking at here, a uh, slightly different address, the port is 8001 instead of 8000. Because I started my promotions engine server running before I started this one running. And so it gave this one the very next port number in sequence. And so that concludes things. Like I say, uh, I'll put this code on GitHub so you can pull it and then integrate it with your own. Have a little play around with it. If you do get stuck with anything, then leave me a comment uh, underneath the video. And just from me personally, I'd like to say well done for making it to the end. Thank you very much. The people that make it to the end of these courses are the people that I make these courses for primarily. Uh, some people complained about the course because I didn't include all the latest, greatest, sexiest stuff like CQRS and things like that. However, we did cover a lot of stuff uh, in Symfony. We looked at caching, exception listeners, uh, all kinds of different things which you may or may not have touched on before. Um, we even touched on some good PHP stuff like solid principles uh, and some design pattern stuff. So all in all, I think if you made it this far, you've probably learned quite a lot. And I've actually learned quite a lot from the comments that I've received from the people on the videos and people uh, suggesting that I do things maybe in a different way. And that's been really uh, eye-opening and helpful to me also. It's been one of my favorite courses to make so far and there's definitely more stuff coming your way soon so i'll see you in the next one if you've enjoyed this video and you'd like youtube to show you more of my content all you need to do is subscribe and click the notification icon and also if you're interested in my full length courses then make sure you check out my site at garyclark.tech i'll leave a link on the screen and in the description